Today, we are live. Thank you, Joanna. Sergeant, will you begin the recordings? According to the PC, all set. According to, recording to the cloud, started. Backup is rolling. Thank you. Sergeant Polite, will you begin your opening statement? Thank you. Good morning and welcome to the remote hearing on immigration, jointly with the Committee on Criminal Justice. Will council members and staff please turn on their video at this time? Once again, will council members and staff please turn on their video at this time? Thank you. To minimize disruptions, please place all cell phones and electronics to vibrate. You may send your testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chairs, we are ready to begin. Thank you. And buenos dias to everyone. Uh, and I will bring this hearing to order. Buenos dias, my name is Carlos Menchaca and I am the chair of the Committee on Immigration here in the New York City Council. We're joined today by my committee colleague uh, or my colleague chair of the Committee on Criminal Justice Keith Powers, uh, and later on, I will acknowledge all the members who are here today. Today, the committees will be conducting oversight on the city's detainer laws with a, with a specific focus on seven incidents brought to our attention related to the Department of Corrections implementation of our local laws. The Committee on Immigration will also hear the following legislation. Resolution number 1648, sponsored by public advocate Jamani Williams and myself, calling on the New York State Legislature to pass and the governor to sign the New York for All Act, which could and will prohibit and regulate the discovery and disclosure of immigration status by New York State and local government entities. Pre-considered introduction, uh, key 2021-7658, sponsored by myself, in relation to creating a private right of action related to civil immigration detainers. Pre-considered introduction T21-7657, sponsored by Councilmember Powers, is related to limiting the circumstances in which a person may be detained by the police department on a civil immigration detainer. And pre-considered intro T21-7657, 2021-7659, sponsored by Councilmember Powers, in relation to limiting communication between the Department of Correction and federal immigration authorities. My co-chair and colleague, uh, my fellow Progressive Caucus uh, co-chair, uh, Councilmember Powers, will speak on his legislation. And we've also been joined by public advocate who will give a statement on his resolution as well. So I'll just say that for now, I am incredibly proud of the work that this committee, these joint committees have done to really ensure that we're talking about some of the more serious things that the city can do at a local level to bring justice to our immigrant families. We wouldn't be able to hold this hearing if it wasn't for the incredible work of our public defenders and advocates who have been fighting on the ground to end deportations every single day. Uh, and they're doing that with the support of the city, but they're doing that because they believe every single day that our city, as we struggle to build a sanctuary city, that we do this work together. And so I wanna say thank you to them. My pre-considered bill would offer relief to families who have watched in horror as their loved ones ended up in ICE custody through a violation of our detainer laws as a result of an interaction with the city AG agency employee. The bill would grant individuals the ability to sue the city for violation of our local laws. When the city violates the detainer law, it can lead to permanent damage and irreparable harm from extended detention, family separation, and deportation. My bill underscores just how seriously we consider a violation of this type. Now, since 2011, the city of New York has attempted to minimize interaction with federal immigration enforcement as a matter of policy. In 2014, the city council passed a package of laws that made clear the city's policy. Local entities were not empowered 
Local entities were not empowered to engage in immigration enforcement, full stop. Federal detainer requests were required to be accompanied by judicial warrants, federal judicial warrants, and the DOC and the NYPD could not hold an eligible individual for longer than state law allowed prior to release. Four years ago, the Committee on Immigration again updated our detainer laws, passing legislation that prohibited the use of any city resource for the purpose of immigration enforcement and applying detainer restrictions on the Department of Probation. In April of 2021, public defenders affiliated with the New York Immigrant Family Unity Project, or NIFUP, presented me and my staff with seven, seven instances where the Department of Corrections appears to have violated our detainer laws or acted in a way that is contrary to the intent of our detainer laws. Most of these instances resulted in ICE transfers of immigrant New Yorkers. Five of the seven occurred within the last year and two of them within the last few months. I'm horrified and I'm angry. These incidents have been shared with the mayoral administration, many of them for the second time. As representatives of the DOC and Moya, uh, they were involved in decision-making regarding these incidents and will be subject to today's discussion. We will hold them accountable. To the representatives of the administration here to testify and answer questions, I urge you to evaluate the guidance you've drafted and the decision makers you've empowered to carry out our city laws. Our city is home to more than 3 million immigrants and trust in government is at an all time low, especially for our immigrant communities. I wanna say thank you to our incredible staff who are running this remote hearing behind the scenes, uh, our immigration committee staff for their work on this committee, council, Arbani Auja, policy analyst, Elizabeth Kronk, and my staff as well, chief of staff, Lorena Lucero, and deputy chief of staff, Cesar Vargas. Uh, and we have, uh, and a special thank you to my former legislative and communications director, Tony Chirito, uh, who's a fierce advocate for justice and is a big reason we're here today talking about these issues. I wanna hand this over to council member and chair Keith Powers uh, for his statement. Thank you, Chairman Chaka, and good morning, everyone. I'm city council member Keith Powers, chair of the committee on criminal justice. And I'm glad that you can join us remotely today for our joint hearing on New York City's detainer law. Uh, over the past decade, the city council has taken many steps to limit the interaction between federal law enforcement and immigrant new Yorkers from expanding the mayor's office of immigrant affairs to enacting sweeping privacy protections to prohibiting ICE on uh, non-public city property. Most critically, our detainer law is meant to ensure that when an immigrant New Yorker is in custody of the city, ICE officers cannot come in and take them away from their families or their communities. Further, the city's detainer law attempts to ensure that the punishment meets the crime by preventing deportation for the minor offenses here. Today, the Committee on Immigration will be hearing two of my bills in relating to limiting the first one in relation to limiting the circumstances in which a person may be detained by the police department on a civil immigration detainer. This bill would amend our detainer law to no longer allow NYPD to detain an individual without a judicial warrant for 48 hours beyond the time when such a person would otherwise be released. Recent case law, case law has determined that this type of detention is illegal. And this bill would update our detainer law to be consistent with that ruling. The second bill is uh, in relation to limiting communication between the Department of Correction and federal immigration authorities. This bill would prohibit DOC staff from communicating with federal immigration authorities regarding any person in DOC custody, unless the communication is in relation to a person for which a civil immigration detainer is being honored or the communication is unrelated to the enforcement of civil, civil immigration laws. When the city law was previously amended, federal law prohibited localities from enacting laws to pre prevent communication with ICE, but a federal court has since deemed this federal pro prohibition to be unconstitutional. Therefore, this bill would limit DOC's communication with ICE to the furthest extent possible. Additionally, we'll also be asking DOC and Moya about the specific instances in which it appears that detainer law was violated. The committees are interested in hearing how these situations arose, 
how both agencies acted to address these situations and what policy changes were made to ensure that this will never happen again. We are committed to protecting immigrant New Yorkers and we will continue to work with public defenders and advocates to ensure that our policies reflect that commitment. I wanna note that myself and, and Council Member Ch Chairman Chaka have sent these instances over to the uh, mayoral administration, the agencies ahead of this hearing. So we do anticipate that we will get some clarity and answers on those violations to the extent that that's possible. With that said, I wanna thank our committee staff for putting together this hearing. I'm gonna head to over to committee council to go over some procedural items. But I, last thing I wanna say is I just wanna really thank Chair Menchaka who pushed very hard to make sure that this hearing happened today and that we were able to provide accountability for those instances where the law was uh, uh, violated and, and of course to push for better policy. So I wanna thank him for his partnership here today. And with that, I'll hand it over to committee council. Thank you, uh, Chair Powers. Um, and actually, I think uh, public advocate, there I see him, uh, public advocate Jamani Williams is here, and I'd like to get him on, if we can unmute him. Uh, and while he's getting unmuted, I want to say that we are welcome council members Holden, Belize, Brooks Powers, Van Bramer, and Moya, who are also here joining us today. Good morning. Can yes. you hear me? Thank you so much. Peace and blessings to everyone. Love and light. Thank you uh, to Chair Manchaka and Chair Powers for this hearing and my uh, ability to say a few words. As I mentioned, my name is Jemani Williams. I'm the public advocate for the city of New York. Uh, this is a very important hear hearing about New York City detainer laws. Uh, and I want to thank you for including uh, my office's resolution 6048 as part of, of the agenda. Uh, just a few years ago, um, myself and Councilman Manchaka actually uh, were involved in preventing somebody from being deported. Uh, and that was the moment when I really realized uh, that although we were sanctuary city, so-called for immigrant residents, city and state law enforcement agencies uh, do unfortunately, uh, whether uh, intentionally or uh, unintentionally, uh, coordinate uh, with ICE and further ICE's cruel and xenophobic uh, agenda. And we have to do whatever we can to prevent that from happening. Uh, and we know by needlessly inquiring about residents' immigration status, sharing information with ICE, and directly collaborating with ICE operations, these agencies have funneled New Yorkers into ICE detention and deportation. These practices break up families and communities, but they, they put the health and safety of immigrant New Yorkers at risk and run very contrary to our values as a city. We did just have to end now. Resolution 6048 calls on the state legislature to pass and for the governor to sign the New York for All Act 82328A uh, by Assembly Member Reyes and S3076A by State Senator Salazar, which would take important steps to ending the municipal and state pipelines to ICE custody through four key provisions. First, it will prohibit state and local officers, including law enforcement and correction officials, from enforcing federal immigration laws and inquiring about immigration status. This will ensure that our state and local agencies do not act outside of their governmental jurisdiction. Second, it will remove language, it will remove language in state law that requires information sharing between state and city agencies with immigration enforcement and limit ICE's access to state informational databases. Third, it will require people in custody, custody to be given notice of their rights before being interviewed by ICE. Further, it will prohibit ICE from entering non-public areas of state or local property without a judicial warrant. If passed at the state level in tandem with the important introductions that are being heard on the city level today, the New York for All Act will create real protections against the ICE deportation machine I urge members of the committee to move this resolution. I want to thank you for your time and consideration uh, and protecting all New Yorkers and really uh, making a push uh, to make sure that everyone is safe within our city. Uh, as we unfortunately are finding out these concerns, uh, although they were heightened uh, during one particular presidency, uh, it's not the, the person who is in office or the party that's in office doesn't necessarily provide protection for all New Yorkers. Uh, these pieces of legislation will. Thank you so much. Thank you, public advocate, uh, Jumani Williams. And just say that we're, we're in this together. And I think we have a lot of things that we can actually do here in the city and the state to make and struggle in that vision of a sanctuary city that we are clearly still struggling with even at our city agencies uh, who are filled with humans and humans that may be ascribed to a white supremacy or xenophobic 
mentality and we'll get to the bottom of that. So thank you so much for your support today. We've also been joined by council members Drum and Diaz. With that, I'm gonna hand this over to Arbani Auja for some technical pieces and procedural items. Thank you, Chair. My name is Herbani Ahuja, and I'm counsel to the Committee on Immigration for the New York City Council. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify when you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called, and I will be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. For everyone testifying today, please note that there may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted, and we thank you in advance for your patience. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. At today's hearing, the first panelist to give testimony will be representatives from the administration, followed by council member questions, and then members of the public will testify. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. I will now call on members of the administration to testify. Testimony will be provided by Kenneth Stukes, DOC Chief of Security. Additionally, the following representatives will be available for answering questions. Dana Wax, Deputy Chief of Staff for the Department of Correction. Linnell McGinley Liddy, First Deputy Commissioner for the Department of Correction. Heidi Grossman, Deputy Commissioner of Legal Matters for the Department of Correction, and Carolina Chavez, Deputy Commissioner and General Counsel at the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Before we begin, I will administer the oath. Um, Chief of Security Kenneth Stukes, Deputy Chief of Staff Dana Wax, First Deputy Commissioner Linnell McGinley Liddy, Deputy Commissioner Heidi Grossman, Deputy Commissioner Carolina Chavez. I will call on you each individually for a response. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Chief, Chief of Security Kenneth Stukes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Deputy Chief of Staff Dana Wax. Yes. Thank you. First Deputy Commissioner Linnell McGinley Liddy. Yes. Thank you. Deputy Commissioner Heidi Grossman. Yes. Thank you. Deputy Commissioner Carolina Chavez. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Chief of Security Kenneth Sooks, you may begin your testimony when you are ready. Good morning, Chair Menchaca, Chair Powers, and members of the Immigrant Committee and Criminal Justice Committee. My name is Kenneth Stukes, and I'm in the Bureau of Chief of Security for the New York City Department of Corrections. I'm joined today by Dana Wax, Deputy Chief of Staff, First Deputy Commissioner Manel Maganley Lidley, and Deputy Commissioner of Legal Matters Heidi Grossman. I'm also pleased to be joined by colleagues at the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, an important partner in matters concerning incarcerated members of the immigrant community. I thank you for the opportunity to testify on the department's practice and with respect to detainer laws and to comment on the three bills being considered at today's hearing. The department recognizes the city's effort to promote policies that support immigrant communities while simultaneously maintaining public safety and confidence in our jails and local government. In accordance with New York City laws, the department does not subject its offices or employees to the direction of federal immigration enforcement authorities. Our policies make clear that DOC role is not to conduct immigration enforcement. This helps give all New Yorkers, irrespective of immigration status, assurance in their local government's integrity. As a matter of policy, the department does not comply with ICE detainers unless specifically directed to by local law. Absent a judicial warrant, generally, the only circumstances under which the Department of Correction is permitted to cooperate with the press to notify ICE of the time of release and transfer custody 
of an incarcerated individual or when the individual has been convicted of a qualifying conviction or is identified as a possible match in the terrorist screening database. And federal immigration authorities provide documentation of their probable cause of immovability. As indicated in the department's latest public report regarding ICE detainers, of the 270 civil immigration detainers lodged with DOC between July of 2019 and June of 2020, only 20 individuals were transferred to federal immigration authorities. In fact, of the 1,925 detainers lodged between October of 2016 and June of 2020, the department has only transferred 5% of the requested individuals to federal immigration authorities, which equates to 90 people over a period of four years. Cooperation happens very infrequently. The department thoroughly reviews an incarcerated individual's case to determine whether they meet the criteria for being transferred upon release. Upon admission to custody, the department may receive a notification from federal authorities that an incarcerated individual has an immigration detainer. If the federal authorities have provided all necessary paperwork, we then assess the individual to determine if they meet the criteria for being transferred upon release. As outlined earlier, in most cases, individuals do not meet the criteria and we notify the federal authorities that we will not honor their detainer. Occasionally, we encounter an individual who has a qualifying conviction as outlined in Administrative Code 9-131. Once aware of the qualifying conviction, the ICE unit of the Custody Management Division confers with the legal division confirm that the individual meets the criteria. Federal immigration authorities will be notified of an individual's impending release only once the ICE unit has confirmed that the individual meets the criteria. However, it is important to note that even in the limited scenarios in which the department cooperates with federal authorities, the department still proceeds with existing discharge procedures. It is not DOC policy to retain individuals due to immigration detainees beyond the time authorized under New York state and local law. With respect to the proposed legislation, pre-considered introduction 7657, with regards to intro 7657, the bill pertains to NYPD's detainment of an individual beyond the time when said individual would otherwise be released from custody. Although this does not concern DOC practices, we would note that as mentioned earlier, even when cooperating with immigration detainers, it is not consistent with DOC policy to detain individuals beyond the time authorized under New York state and local law. Pre-considered introduction 7658. With regards to intro 7658, the department has concerns regarding the broad circumstances that may give, give rise to a claim, as it will be difficult to differentiate causes in which an individual is held for an extended period due to an immigration detainer versus when an individual is held for an extended period due to other factors. We look forward to discussing further with counsel. We considered introduction 7659. With regards to intro 7659, the New York City is committed to protecting the rights of undocumented individuals. The department doesn't have concern that this legislation will remove the city's flexibility that only allows the city to cooperate with ICE in very limited circumstances. We are continuing to review the legislation and look forward to continuing discussion with the council on the procedures in place to prevent unnecessary cooperation with ICE. The Department of Correction is committed to carrying out its goals in protecting the safety and security of all individuals within our facilities. Those goals do not include enforcement of immigration laws. We appreciate the council's interest in protecting the immigrant community and my colleagues and I are happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'm now gonna turn it over to questions from Chairman Chaka followed by Chair Powers. Panelists, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Chaka, please begin. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I wanna see, I wanna say thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, you gave a review of the, of the law uh, and, and I think we're gonna be really kind of trying to drill down about where we believe the law was not just violated but that it was violated um, in the spirit of the law itself. And this is why we're trying to correct it. 
And I just want, before I move into some of the questions, which mostly are gonna focus on the accountability on the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs and Chair Powers will focus on corrections. Um, Chief, if you can tell us a little bit about all the laws essentially that are pertaining to the pre-considered laws you're, you're not in support of, right? I, I think I kind of heard you walk through each and uh, you have problems with all of them. Is that right? And that not one is good for you and, and support. Um, this is Heidi Grossman, Deputy Commissioner for Legal Matters. Uh, I, I would just um, reiterate what uh, the Chief uh, testified to in his testimony. Uh, regarding the pre-considered introduction to 7567, 7658, and 7659. Um, we, we, um, we welcome the opportunity to talk with the council uh, further, uh, but we stand by our testimony in terms of what our concerns are. So you do not support the laws as they're written or the, the, the pre-considered well, legislation? Right, we, have, we, we articulate that there are concerns. I mean, as for the um, 7657, that has to do with the police department. The department can't speak to that particular bill, um, but as to 7658 with the private right of action, um, as stated, we do have concerns about um, the broad circumstances giving rise to a private right of action. Uh, and um, we do, uh, look forward to talking with the council further to further discuss our concerns. Um, as to 7659, um, the department does have concerns that this removes the city's flexibility, um, allowing the, the city to, um, co to communicate with ICE under very, very limited circumstances. And that is something that um, we would invite, we, we welcome further conversations with the city council. Okay, and just so I can clarify, I, I there's a room of four of you. Who who's the one speaking right now? I'm sorry, I have my mask on. I apologize. My name is Heidi Grossman, Deputy Commissioner for Legal Matters. Deputy Commissioner Heisman. Grossman. 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 Okay, and will you be answering questions from here and out on behalf of the chief or? Well, uh, I think we're a panel um, where um, that um, so we're going to be both um, answering questions. Okay, great. So I'm going to move over to some of my prepared questions for the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. And uh, I'm going to start at the top, which is um, directly directed to Moya. How would you describe the role that Moya plays in regard to the implementation of the city's detainer law? Uh, we're looking for just a sense of relationship here. How many individuals have been transferred to ICE custody in violation of the city's detainer law? since the adoption. So, <clears throat> excuse me, good morning. Um, and I, I, I do not believe we've met before. So Chairman Chaka, my name no. is Nina Chavez. I am a deputy commissioner over at Moya as well as the general counsel. Uh, in terms of this Moya's role with uh, respect to the, the detainer law, excuse me, sorry. <clears throat> um, our role is one of advising and supporting to make sure that the criminal justice agencies who are implicated by the detainer law are, are uh, complying with it, right? And we advise in situations uh, where it's a policy matter. As you know, we have worked with uh, the council over the last eight years to really hone in on a detainer law that is uh, very narrow and restrictive. As far as the operations of the detainer law, that would be something that we would defer to uh, DOC in this instance, for example, to talk to any statistics or also speak to um, the process that they take in order to comply with the detainer law, but Moya as a whole with our city partners uh, has a really strong commitment to making sure that we are complying with the, the detainer law and, and that's the role that we play. Okay, so then what, what have you observed? So it sounds like you observe all of these cases. How many have violated? How many instances? How many violations have you recorded uh, in the time since the detainer laws have been uh, passed and made law? I believe that my uh, DOC colleagues can speak to the specific statistics or, or numbers that may be um, out there, but as you'll see in the report that we filed uh, a few months ago in terms of the detainer report, um, there was one instance of violation, which I believe is one of the ones that we'll be discussing today, 
Um, other than that, it's our understanding that we have been in compliance with the container law. Okay, and is that your determination as Moya, or are you taking are you taking D DOC's determination of violation of law? Um, we work as a city with city partners to make sure that we're complying with the law. We have, as you know, an oversight capacity um, as, over the other criminal justice agencies. So we, we work with law, we work with DOC, NYPD, uh, DOP to ensure that there's compliance. Um, and we trust that our city partners are working with us and communicating accurately. Okay, uh, let's move on. In cases one, four, and seven, and these were cases where we shared with you before the hearing and is available on the web to everyone uh, in the community report, the committee report, Moya was involved in reviewing DOC decision-making that led to immigration enforcement. Was Moya aware of these and other cases before receiving our letter? Of the, uh, of the incidents that were in the report, we were aware of two of the incidents that were reported. Um, and which two are those? Those would be the uh, number four involving Rogelio LS, and then number seven, the Bronx Defenders client number three, and I'm sorry, number one being Javier Castillo Marayaga, which was a case that we are also familiar with. Okay. And so what did you do when you first learned of these cases? Um, Okay, I'll, I'll take them in, uh, in order, I suppose. As far yeah. as case number one for Javier Castillo Maradiaga, that was a case that we became familiar with um, in the, uh, shortly after it happened, about a week after it happened. So the incident occurred um, back in, I believe it was mid-December of 2019. About a week later, Moya was informed of what had occurred. We immediately reached out to the family to see if we could provide any support um, and also communicate put them in touch with any legal service providers. At that time, they declined uh, our offers of support in that capacity. Um, and then fast forward, going forward to 2021, when it came to our attention in January that there was an imminent deportation of Mr. Maradiaga. Again, we uh, were uh, in communication with advocates, we were in communication with counsel, um, as in his counsel, as well as with our city partners, uh, including our Federal Legislative Affairs Office and Corporation Counsel's Office to uh, do the best we could to, to mitigate the harm that had occurred, um, to advocate for his release. And um, so that is the extent to which we've been involved in that particular case. Um, as far as the other two cases that we were alerted to, we did not actually play an active role in those other than uh, I believe in one of the instances communicating some information as to the circumstances, but really DOC would be the one who would have the details of what those incidents included. Okay, and I think we're gonna go through that with DOC after we're done with Moya, with you. Um, what resources did Moya utilize to assist in the release of these individuals from ICE custody or to stop the actual ICE transfer? As far as, uh, again, Mr. Castillo Maradiaga's case, which is the one where we were more heavily involved, as I said, we, um, as you know, there are legal services that are provided to uh, all immigrant New Yorkers who may need them, including people who may be facing uh, civil immigration cases and, and in DOC custody or have a criminal case. Um, so we uh, provided a connection to some of those, at those legal service providers that we work with that would have been back in December of 2019. Again, those services were declined at the time, I believe. Well, I won't speak for Mr. Castillo Maradiaga, but the decision, their family decided to, 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 to go another route. Once we um, came, when it, once it came to 2021, at that point, um, our office was heavily engaged with all of the different parts of city government that are, are involved. So we talked to DOC, we talked to law. Again, our federal legislative affairs office was in contact with um, the different representatives for New York at the federal level. Um, and, and then also we, we were able to file a letter of support signed by the Corporation Council in Mr. Castillo Maradiaga's habeas case in the Southern District. Okay. And I think at this point, I, for, for folks listening, and we're going really micro into the weeds on this, what, we're, what I'm trying to illustrate here is the fact that we have a Department of Corrections that we believe is violating law and a mayor's administration that is now trying to fix the situation and utilizing resources 
to stop a deportation that could have been prevented in the first place by not violating the spirit of the law, which is why we're trying to fix it. And so this is really helpful for us to understand that where one hand is is pushing this way and another hand is doing this way, and it's just a um, and it's leaving a, a kind of horror in the families that are being separated by the city of New York. So let's move on to the next question. Um, does Moya review communication between DOC and ICE? And how often does it actually review that communication? No, the communications that DOC receives uh, or, or has with other law enforcement is within their review. Okay, so and there's no there so there's no no review. Uh, what prevents Moya from reviewing that direct communication between DOC and ICE? The role that we play in the way that the detainer law is effectuated. Is, is at a level of support and guidance when it comes to the actual um, to, to, to determination as to whether or not um, there is a case that necessitates some sort of communication with civil, uh, with civil immigration enforcement. We are not involved in the operational day-to-day uh, -day that the Department of Correction um, has. However, again, we work very closely with them as our partner in, in ensuring that we're complying with this detainer law that we're, we're we're very proud of for having been able to tailor something that is really the most restrictive detainer law in the country. So we work with our partners, we, we trust our partners and communicate with them regularly, but we also uh, respect the fact that their operation, they, they control their operational needs. And I just wanna to link to the previous questions that you got heavily involved with cases one, four and seven uh, and, and just kind of see the, the the conundrum that we're in right now, where you're not logging information and understanding of the communication between agencies or city agencies and ICE, yet when, when the community comes out and says there's, an, there's something going on that's wrong, the administration does inject themselves into the case work and tries to prevent the deportation. And so I, I just, I'm, I'm having trouble really reconciling the moments of engagement and that we have a problem here. And this is why we're trying to fix some of this stuff. Um, so moving on, did Moya and, uh, well, really did Moya's team work with DOC in preparing the internal policy document called Interactions with Federal Immigration Authorities? Did, did you all work together to prepare that? Um, I just wanted to correct one thing in terms of uh, what you just, you just said council member, we were, we, we had a lot of dealings that had to do with number one, number four and number seven, we were aware of. So I wouldn't say that we were heavily involved in either of those cases. Um, and I would have to get back to you as to whether or not DOC, uh, Moya was worked with DOC on the creation of that policy. Okay, that, that's gonna be helpful for us as we, as we get a fuller picture about, about the, the issue that we're seeing here today with Moya, NYPD, DOC, and all the other agencies. Uh, let's then move to, regarding case number one, uh, Mr. Javier Castillo Maradiaga, who was just released from ICE custody in March following the city's violation of our detainer law. What specific communications occurred between ICE and DOC regarding Mr. Castillo uh, and what method of communication was used? I think that would be a question for DOC. Okay. Um, let's, okay, if I could, uh, Chair Powers, then I'll just hand that over to, to DOC for that. Uh, and then also just note that, that Moya doesn't have this information. Sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, and the question, the question to DOC is um, regarding Javier Castillo's case, and he was just released from ICE in March uh, following the violation of our detainer law. What specific communication occurred between ICE and DOC regarding Mr. Castillo and what method of communication was used? Um, first of all, I just want to say that this is Heidi Grossman, Deputy Commissioner for Legal Matters. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I do wanna say uh, that the department takes compliance with these uh, laws very seriously. Um, 
It is not the department's role to conduct immigration enforcement. Uh, we support efforts to promote policies that support immigrant communities. And we also want to be, acknowledge and, and um, express our regret about the outcome concerning um, Mr. Castillo Maradiaga's um, transfer to ICE. This is not consistent with department practice or protocol. This was an operational error. And we appreciate the, um, the impact that this has had on Mr. Castillo Maradiaga and his family. And we, we want to express our deep regret for that. Um, Thank you for that. Yes. Much appreciated. And if we can focus on the question though, what was that communication and in what way was that communicated? We, uh, one of our uh, members of the service uh, did not follow policy and had a communication when uh, there was no qualifying conviction. And that currently is, this individual has been um, charged with uh, violations of the department's uh, procedures and policies. And the matter is currently being, uh, the, uh, is under a process of discipline. And uh, that is, so it would be, uh, we really do need to let that process play out in terms of, of what that determination is and what the facts reveal. Uh, but uh, the person was uh, admitted into our custody um, after bail was posted. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, on December 15th, bail was posted at about um, in the evening, around 8, 8, 8 p.m. or 8.30 p.m. And then what he was discharged uh, to ICE uh, the next morning around close to 9, 9 a.m. in the morning. Um, in terms of the communication and the back and forth, uh, since this matter is being um, pursued through discipline, uh, it's very difficult for me to speak about what those details are because the person who uh, was involved is uh, represented by counsel, is going through a disciplinary process. So we have to let that play out. Okay, I'm gonna press a little bit because this is this is really pivotal. Uh, and I wanna thank you for reminding us about the law. I mean, we, we, we wrote the law. This is why we're here because there's been violation. And this is one that we caught uh, in, in real uh, gratitude by the, the defenders that we're gonna hear from after this discussion ends. But uh, is there any, any legal reason why you're not giving us the information and may compel us to a subpoena or some other way to get that information. I think this is gonna be incredibly important for this discussion and is gonna elevate your ability to be partners in good faith with the city council. Uh, and I wanna work with you. So help us understand how this happened. This was human error, I get it. They are gonna be held accountable, but we, we, I need to understand what that communication is from you. Sure. I mean, I, I will say that generally when there's, I, I, I don't know, I don't personally know what the communication was, but I know generally. Does um, anybody know um, at DOC I, table right now? Can, can I speak to the, the general means of communication would be um, through email or an occasional phone call. Um, so I don't know that. Um, so the issue here isn't about the means of communication, because when the law authorizes communication through an email or a, an occasional phone call, that would be appropriate under the current version of the law. So I, you know, in terms of did the person communicate or not, we know that there was a communication because ICE came and picked up the individual. Um, and as I said, that was not consistent with department policy uh, in that this person did not have a qualifying conviction. So our, our and I, I do wanna say, uh, council member that um, we too were very concerned about the results and the outcome and the department as well was very involved, was, in, was contributed and participated in trying to come up to contribute to the citywide effort to do the most we could do for um, Mr. Castillo Maridiago and his family. Uh, so we, we also communicated with individuals to try to um, convey information uh, and we were very, very concerned. And as a result of uh, this event, uh, what we did was we enhanced some of our procedures and practices. And uh, one of the things that we did was we immediately retrained uh, our custody management division 
we and we also in, introduced a 24-7 um, supervision. We added a captain um, as a supervisor to the, to the process to make sure that there's uh, supervision and review at those those times. We also added. Well, can, can I pause you there? Um, just because I think I think this is going to be important uh, to the long, longer conversation about about re reinstating trust with the Department of Corrections, which we are in we are in shaky ground here. And I want to ensure that we get through some of the questions that we need to be able to understand how we're going to build the law, because we are also thinking about that and how to correct these issues when human error uh, that's rooted in white supremacy and uh, xenophobia is being utilized. And, and so one case that we have caught, and this is what we're just talking about, one out of seven uh, have ripple effects. And so this is going to take more than a retraining to really, really get us back to where we need to be. Uh, and so let's move on to the next question, if I could, and we'll come back to that, I promise, on understanding how, you're, how you've been retraining internally. Um, what time on December 15, the bail, um, what time on December 15th was the bail posting processed uh, and commenced? And what time was ICE contacted? And how long does it normally take for an individual to be, to be released once bail is posted? Um, there's a few timing issues here. So if, if, if you have a document that talks about a little bit about timing, I wanna get a sense of the bail posting, ICE contacted, how long does it take for an indiv individual to be released after bail? And how long did it take for bail to be posted in this case? Oh, I, I can't speak to the individual circumstances regarding Mr. Castilla Maradiaga's transfer. What I can say is that um, our processing, there, there are many factors that go into the discharge process that are unrelated to uh, discussions with um, or unrelated to the ICE detainer process. Uh, and um, I will say that, that um, that we take uh, timely discharge of people um, very seriously. It's very important that we timely discharge individuals. And what um, is that time? What, what, how quickly can that happen? Well, um, it, it, there, it depends on a variety of factors. Uh, so uh, there are, when someone posts bail, the law, the local law requires that we uh, discharge individuals from notice of the posting of bail within three hours, but there are exceptions. And the exceptions would include um, the, the complexities involved with discharge planning, uh, making sure that people receive their medication. Um, if they fall into a class known as the Brad H, making sure we discharge people at the right time of day. Making and, where, sure and where do they get released? And, and really specifically, with this case, where was Javier's transfer? Um, where did it happen where DOC uh, transferred to ICE? Where did that occur uh, inside the jail? Sure. Um, let me just say that in addition to the discharge planning, there might be immediate medical needs and mental health needs that might delay someone's discharge generally. There may be issues with bail surety. There may be warrant holds out of state that might um, impact the timing of the, the discharge process. And there may be warrants, federal judicial warrants that, that allow for, for the detainer? There could be uh, warrant holds that have nothing to do with the ICE detainers or judicial warrants. It could be a hold from another state um, that um, could impact um, the discharge. That wasn't the, case, that wasn't the case for Javier, is that right? No, it was not. I was just, you had asked about the regular discharge process. Yeah, uh, that's right. so thank be, you for that. And, that, and I wanted to just let you know that there's a whole discharge process that, um, and the exceptions under the law that, that I mentioned that um, someone should generally be released within three hours of notice of the bail paid, um, except when there are, these, there are certain exceptions. Um, there could also be questions with the court paperwork. Uh, sometimes okay. there- So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause here on the, on the um, possibilities here and, and really kind of move to the location and I want to know where Javier was transferred to ICE and how ICE knew about that location and where to meet a DOC officer uh, and Javier. Uh, I think that um, what, uh, as I said, when, when an individual 
uh, meets the the criteria for uh, to enable the department to communicate with ICE and let ICE know that there is an individual that it has a qualifying conviction within the last five years and that this individual is going to be processed for discharge. Uh, the general way that that is communicated is through email um, and occasionally, uh, usually by email. Um, if there's an occasional phone call, I, I can't speak to that, but I know that, that practically speaking, that that may happen. So when I, while I say I can't really speak to specific circumstances about when um, the member of our service actually communicated with ICE at this point in time, uh, I, I can say that that would be our practice and our policy. So there's no reason to think that it was not, it wasn't the manner in which um, our member of service communicated. And uh, we're, we're like, looking for location here. Uh, sure. Deputy, sure. Yeah, a location. I believe the individual, and I, I could confirm that, was from BCBC. BCBC. Right, from our um, BCBC facility. Uh, that's where um, the individual was housed. And so the um, ICE would have um, come to BCBC to um, pick up um, Mr. Castillo Mauritiaga. Okay. And at what point did the city determine that the detainer law was broken and which agencies were involved in making that determination? Uh, I mean, that th I, I can say that we, um, I can't speak to the exact moment in time, but I know that very soon thereafter, we identified that there was an issue. We all um, um, communicated um, to figure out what are the best next steps. And um, general counsel, deputy commissioner, general counsel at Moya, um, very clearly articulated all the details about how um, the city city efforts uh, to try to remediate and um, address this very unfortunate situation. And, and is this is this DOC completely, or is this also in communication with Moya? I I would we I, I believe we you know I I would say that uh, Moya and the department. Um, and many city partners that um, are involved in the um, interpretation of the law and implementation. We've been in constant communication since the law went into effect in terms of um, trying uh, uh, receiving yeah. support from Moya in the way that. I'm just going to I'm just going to interrupt because we're we're doing generalities here, and I just want to very specific on this case. We could get a sense of the flow. Uh, was it the mayor's office of immigrant affairs that informed you first that there was a violation? Uh, and you're saying we, there's a bigger we of partners that help make this determination. I, I, want, can't. I want to get a sense about, about how in this case with uh, Mr. Castillo that that, that, that happened. I, I can't speak to that specific question at this point in time. Oh, is that because you don't know or because you're holding uh, back information because of the case? No, I'm not. I'm not sure that I, um, at this point in time, um, recall exactly um, what the sequencing of events were. Um, I think at the end of the day, I, I come back to we really regret what happened. Um, we yeah, and I hear that, and I, I hear that. So I'm going to pause you there. Thank you. So I, I hear your regrets, and we're going to we're going to fix it. We're going to. I promise you, we're going to fix this. Uh, and I want to go to Ms. Chavez over at the mayor's office, if you know the answer to that question, and whether or not it was Moya that informed DOC of the violation and got it got going on the ultimate determination and process. When the incident occurred in 2019, DOC alerted us as to the fact that there had been an erroneous transfer. Um, from there, it was Moya who was working closely with DOC, constantly communicating about it. We got in touch with Law, who also um, is, is closely works with us when it comes to interpretation and compliance with the detainer. Uh, I believe the first deputy mayor's office was also involved in those communications. Um, so uh, specifically, those were the, the, the different agencies that were automatically alerted and kept in the loop throughout the time. And I'm sure, um, I'm sure the council's office and some other parts of City Hall as well. Okay. So uh, I'm, I have a couple more questions for the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. I'm gonna hand it over to Chair uh, Powers. We've also been joined by Councilmember Rivera and Amprey Samuel. Thank you so much for being here and uh, listening to this, this moment as we look at, at oversight of our laws. Uh, 
for for Moya in 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 Mr. Castillo's case, Moya shared with the representing attorney that updated guidance has been shared with DOC to avoid similar grie uh, grievous mistakes in the future. What are these updates? Um, what policies, procedures, protocols governing NYPD and DOC communications with ICE and DHS and in any other uh, subcomponent of ICE existed before December 16th, 2019? And what are the policies now? I want to get a sense. And I think DOC was just talking a little bit about what they've done, but I, I want to hear from what Moya is doing and what communication uh, to the agencies and changes have happened since uh, 2019, December 16, 2019. So I'll let um, the, what, after the, the incident occurred in 2019, there were conversations as to how to prevent that from happening again. And again, I'll let uh, DOC speak to the corrective actions that were taken to create a process that prevented that from happening. Again, I, uh, in broad strokes, it involved the order in which communications were, were, were made to law department, as well as with Moya, I believe, uh, uh, the general counsel for DOC already referred to um, some of the other specifics uh, as to uh, operationally how they take care of that in terms of, um, yeah, and I'll leave it at that. Okay, and we can follow up to ensure that we get, I want, I want to see communication as well uh, and in terms of the highlighted, not the broad strokes, but the specifics. And uh, it's our understanding, uh, Ms. Chavez, that the, that there's an oath trial that has been calendared for the DOC employee who broke the city law in effectuating an ICE detainer. Please share the date of the trial uh, if it's upcoming. Uh, and if it already happened, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the decision and the date of that hearing? Given that's a disciplinary process that uh, DOC is directly looped into, I would defer to my colleague at DOC. Okay, over to you, DOC. Uh, you are on mute. You're still on mute. You okay, may not yeah. you you may have yeah. Yes. Um, uh, just to, you, you asked about policy that was implemented. Uh, one of the um, additions to uh, our practice is that we have, uh, be before our custody management unit will be uh, authorized to communicate with ICE, there we've introduced a legal review of um, any um, consideration uh, for uh, whether an individual meets a qualifying conviction and meets the criteria for sharing information with ICE. And so that is something that we've implemented in, the, in January following the um, transfer of Mr. Um, Castillo Maradiaga to ICE. Um, and we have implemented that. Um, the attorneys are available during regular business hours as well as during off hours and weekends. Um, so we have coverage um, at all at hours so that our custody management can confer with the with a lawyer in the legal division. Um, as to the oath proceeding, uh, that is uh, that is currently the, the matter has been um, uh, is now in discovery, I believe, and that then normally when a matter is in discovery there it will be a time after that discovery is exchanged where um, a case will have be conferenced before oath and um, a trial date may be set and uh, the process moves forward um, so that that's where that's the status of that matter i will note that the individual member of the um, department who was involved with this um, communication was um, transferred from the custody management unit uh, immediately. Uh, I will also note that the, the individual was suspended for 14 days without pay. And um, in addition, uh, that, those, are, those are some immediate steps that we took immediately following um, this, this incident. Um, I, I do wanna note that, well, one is too many. We, as I said, we regret. Um, I do want to note that the department um, has uh, implemented the law since its inception 
and with over 1,925 ICE detainers lodged, um, there were 90 um, individuals, as, as we reported, who were transferred. Um, so I, in terms of the number of people who um, we transferred in violation of the law, uh, we, we have one individual, and that's one too many. Um, the Thank department you. is very seriously and works very hard to implement the law in compliance, the, the, the law. Absolutely. One, one is too many, and, and we have six other ones as well. And I think this is part of the, part of the problem. And, and don't worry, like I said, we're going we're gonna to fix this. And we want to hope we hope we can work with you to make that happen. I'm going to pause here. I've been I've been I've been taking a lot of time here and hand over to my uh, co-chair uh, Keith Powers uh, for questions. And I have a few other ones for Moya, but I'll come back to that. And uh, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Chairman Chaka. Um, thank everyone for your testimony and and answering questions. Um, I, just a starting point here. Uh, Chairman Chaka and myself had sent over a letter a few weeks ago outlining some of the concerns that we had and some of the issues and cases that brought us most concern. Is there a expected response that we should be receiving from the agencies and an expected timeline when we might get a written response to that? Uh, Chair Powers, um, this is Heidi Grossman again. Uh, I, I do want to address the um, seven cases that I believe were um, um, sent to the department, uh, to the commissioner. Um, my understanding is uh, that short of, we've talked about Mr. Castillo Maradiaga, but the other um, of the seven, one is um, have Mr. Castillo Maradiaga, the other um, six, one was not, was not transferred, one individual was not transferred to ICE, and the other five uh, were properly, um, were, were people who had qualifying convictions and therefore the department's position is that those transfers to ICE were in compliance and consistent with the local law. So we're not quite understanding now. I will say that we, the information that was provided to us was we didn't have identifying information. We didn't have all the names. Um, there were initials provided. We did our best to do what we could do to um, look into who these people could be. So short of getting more information and more details from the city council, um, our, um, what we know right now is our, our information reveals that these individuals were convicted um, of qualifying convictions and that we, um, that we followed the law when we, when we um, communicated with ICE. Um, okay, I think Chairman, Chairman, yeah, go ahead. I just, in, with regards to your specific question that you sent us a letter and that you're wondering about the response, um, it was our understanding that we would use this time uh, today in the hearing to walk through those cases. If following the hearing, you'd still like a written response from the, the department that uh, summarizes what we're telling you today, you know, happy to send that, but um, we haven't responded because we, we understood that Okay, I got it. I got it. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Um, uh, I, I think Chairman Jack may have some additional questions on, on those cases, so I'll let him ask those and we'll come back to that. I just want to briefly just also acknowledge we've been joined by Council Members Amber Samuel, Diaz, Rivera, Drum, and Riley as well. Um, on the one instance where I, I think you have conceded and acknowledged that was a issue here. I, I think the one thing that I'm kind of been confused about the whole time is this was a individual who was arrested for a jaywalking offense, as I understand it. And I'm, I'm sort of confused and maybe you can help uh, maybe explain to me because I, I may be missing a detail here, but what is the, how does an individual gets arrested for jaywalking end up in DOC's jurisdiction? I, I would always assume that would be a a ticket that would somebody would receive. How, well, what is the what is the um, an instance or what happened in this instance where DOC then would have jurisdiction and custody over that person? Uh, I, I I can only say that we, you know, the court is involved with um, issuing securing orders. Uh, so we receive an individual, and um, it's really not up to the department to question the reason why the court. Um, issued a securing order returning, remanding the individual to the department's custody. So I don't know that the department has um, any information that we can shed light on with respect to your question. 
at this point in time. Okay, so but does it agree that we will be having some follow up uh, instant, you know, conversation or maybe some regards? I think it might be helpful to understand context a little bit because um, it, I, 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 you know, agree there must be some additional context here. But for the for the for those who are following this and see an arrest on jaywalking, it would be sort of uh, an important detail, I guess, to, to understand why, you know, how DOC would end up with that person in custody. Um, I want to go just through briefly the process here, uh, the ICE detainer process uh, uh, against someone in DOC custody. So um, maybe describe the ICE detainer process against someone in DOC custody, who at DOC is informed by ICE, how are they informed, how is the detainer received? Can you go through those that process for us? Yes, sir. Good morning again. Uh, this Good morning. is Duke speaking. Good morning, Chair Powers. Uh, currently, uh, civil immigration detainees that are lodged on people in custody are sent centrally to the Department's Office of Custody and Management ICE unit. Uh, subsequently, ICE or NYPD notifies a DOC of a detainer request when an individual comes into uh, DOC custody. Uh, DOC then submits a receipt to ICE that the detainer request has been received. The ICE unit will determine whether the individual meets the uh, qualifying crime criteria when an individual has a judgment entered on a qualifying crime in the last five years prior to the date of the uh, incident arrest. The ICE unit reviews the individual's rap sheet going back five years, including a review for terrorist indicators. If the individual does not have a qualifying conviction, the ICE unit will notify federal authorities of such no further contact is made after this notification. If the individual does have a qualifying conviction, notification is made to ICE during the discharge process. Okay, and, and how many, how, how large, there's a, what, what, just repeat for me again, the name of the unit at DOC, it's, it's the, uh, uh, you named it, but I, I couldn't remember the name of the unit we're talking about. Office of Custody and Management. And, okay. I, how many? How many individuals? That that's that is a particular unit that is uh, in charge of handling these requests and these requests only, or they, do they do other work as well within the department? That unit is uh, charged with uh, dealing with ICE requests. Okay. How many individuals? How big? How big is that unit? I'm just, just curious from a staffing standpoint. Staffing, uh, there's a uh, supervisor uh, that's assigned uh, to that unit. Uh, and there are several correction officers who also work along with the uh, supervisor. It's several, one or two, 12 is, you know, what, what, is, what is that? Uh, what's it's probably under five. I would uh, say there's uh, between two to five persons that's assigned to the unit that works under the supervision of the uh, captain. Okay, and did I hear earlier, and I might have been confused that there was previously not a supervisor in that unit and now there's been one added or was I mistaken saying that? I believe, I believe that um, um, at the very, there may have been, um, I, don't, I don't know that there were frequent, um, as my understanding is, I don't know that there were frequent um, ICE detainer discharges during the early morning hours or, you know, at those times. And um, so I think that we recognize that there was a need to shore that up and make sure that we had around the clock supervision, people available um, to deal with this um, immediately. So that's so coverage was added to provide 24 uh, seven coverage. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Okay. And um, how is an individual informed if there is, uh, after DOC is informed, how is the actual individual informed? And uh, second question ties, is DOC involved in serving the detainer on the individual? No. Uh, DOC has no interest in uh, servicing the uh, person with regards to the uh, detainer. Okay, and then the first question is how is the individual themselves informed? Individual custody. Chair Powers, for the most part, as um, you know, I know my colleagues, sorry, it's Dave, I'm talking. Um, for the most part, as my colleagues have testified, the department does not comply with the ICE detainer. 
in, in almost all cases, and we only, we only apply in very limited cases. Um, and so we don't notify the person um, because we're not, certainly because we're not complying with the detainer. Um, and for the five percent, the five percent cases, I think you, I think you guys use the number five percent. What what how, how is the individual informed in that case? The, the ice place at the time of discharge. Right, right. When a person has a qualifying conviction and there is a uh, ice detainer that the department is complying with, the person is notified of the detainer uh, during the time of discharge. At discharge, okay. Um, what? Um, I think you've talked about this a little bit, but I wanted to just clarify. Once a detainer has been lodged, what steps does the Department of Corrections take in examining whether a detainer is to be honored and the individual transferred to ICE? Can you just, I know you've talked about that a little bit. Can you just walk us through that process one more time? Okay. Uh, once the uh, detainer is uh, lodged, uh, the department submits the ICE receipt to that the detainer request has been received then the ICE unit will determine whether the individual meets the qualifying crime criteria when the individual has had a judgment entered on a qualifying crime in the past five years prior to the date of the instant arrest. The ICE unit reviews the individual's uh, rap sheet, you know, going back five years, including a review for terrorist indicators. If the individual does not have a qualifying conviction, the ICE unit will notify federal authorities of such, then there's no further contact is made after this uh, notification. If the individual does have a qualifying conviction, notification is made to ICE during the discharge process. Okay. Um, does the commissioner ever get involved in any of these in terms of reviewing them before they happen or anybody in the actual you know, commissioner's office? Do they have any sort of um, oversight or insight into when these are happening? Not, not generally. I think that this uh, um, usually the custody management division will um, um, assess and determine whether there there there's a qualifying conviction uh, under the law. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there will be conferral with with a lawyer from the legal division, uh, and then if that there there is a qualifying conviction. Uh, that information will be uh, communicated back to custody management, and then custody management will process the discharge accordingly. Uh, accordingly. Okay. And if it is determined that DOC will notify and transfer to ICE, can you just tell us the, the protocol there? Who's, um, uh, you know, who from DOC or other agencies would be involved there? And I think you've talked a little bit about communication to ICE. Um, does that happen in writing, phone conversations? How does that communication occur? Uh, typically, uh, the uh, notification of a person being discharged from a custody uh, who meets the criteria uh, is typically via an email during the discharge process. So you will email somebody over at ICE to notify them that you are uh, agreeing and acknowledging the transfer and that that's going to happen. Is that correct? Yes. So, does that ever I happen in... By phone or uh, or writing, otherwise in in uh, in hard copy communication writing. I I no, I would say that um, as a chief said, it's typically by email, um, and that's generally um, the way that the department will typically mm -hmm. communicate. Um, if there are occasions where there might be um, a conversation, not not sure when that would be, but I don't want to rule that out because that's. Uh, but typically, it's from through email. And okay. I want to um, just make sure when I earlier when I used the word comply with the detainer, and just to, to be clear about the time of notification to ICE. Um, we let ICE know that somebody is being discharged. We don't comply with the detainer in the sense that we detain the person. We just, it's, that's why it's just an email and not a, uh, you know, formal letter, a hard copy letter. We let, we let ICE know someone is being discharged today. And if they show up, they show up. Got it. And so then my, my next question was going to be, you know, how long can an individual be in DOC custody post case resolution prior to a detainer being honored? So what, just can you give us the answer to that question then? So I would, I, let me just say that um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be really specific about um, responding to the question because the, the words that you're using, honoring a detainer, it has a meaning under the law, 
which means that the department may only on, honor a civil immigration detainer by holding a person beyond the time when they would otherwise be released. So we're not, I, I just, I'm just being very specific to the, the language of the, of the law, that we're not honoring ICE detainers in the way that the law contemplates. What we are doing is we are, um, our policy is to notify ICE when we have someone who has a qualifying con con conviction, um, we are, our policy is to continue with the discharge process uh, and ICE will make a determination whether they're going to send someone to pick up the individual or not for transfer. Uh, and um, our policy is not to delay the discharge process so that ICE can pick someone up. That's not our policy. So if a person is, is scheduled to be released in that case, they are released, they're not being held beyond there. Is that what you're saying the agency policy is, is not to hold beyond the, the schedule of release to allow for? Right, and, um, and you know, the, the department, as I mentioned earlier in my testimony, the department um, needs to go through discharge process. Uh, and there are many um, aspects that go into the discharge process and many steps. Um, so the department proceeds with the discharge process and it, it goes on simultaneously with the notification to ICE. Um, and if ICE, um, our policy is if, if ICE comes before, you know, what, um, if the ICE comes to pick up the person, then we will transfer that person. If ICE doesn't come, we're not holding someone um, solely to transfer that person to ICE. That's not our policy. I could, can, can you describe a situation when DOC would grant ICE advance notice of release? Well, I guess you're describing, but what in which DOC would grant ICE advance notice of release and what documentation ICE must present in that situation? Um, well, a, judi a judicial warrant would. Uh, can you just repeat the question again? I just want to. Yeah, I said, please describe a situation in which DOC would grant ICE advance notice of release. And what documentation must I present in that situation? Well, I, it's the same. I think it's if um, when we receive, uh, when an ICE detainer is lodged, the chief mentioned how we go through a process of um, determining whether the person meets the qualifying conviction and whether we are going to comply or not. Uh, and then fast forward to the actual, a, a person could be sentenced and could be in our custody for many months. Um, a person could be with us for many weeks and months before they make bail or they're released. And so then fast forward to um, shortly before when, when we're getting ready for discharge, if we know that the person meets the qualifying conviction and the criteria, uh, we then utilize the provision of the administrative code that allows us to communicate with ICE at that point in time to say that uh, this person, we expect we are, we are planning to discharge this individual. Okay, I want to get to the other cases that Chairman Chuck wanted to ask about, but just in the interest of the individual, I know I know that since some of these are sensitive personnel issues, but in the more operationally here in the department, the issue where an individual had broken policy and law to uh, to um, cooperate or or uh, uh, work with ICE uh, against you know what the agency's intention and policy is. Um, the, was that an, I, I just like, I'm, I'm just, my kind of question, my question really is, is that, was that perceived to be an intentional breaking of it or an operational breakdown of policy that led to that incident? Um, this, this individual was charged with conduct unbecoming and failure to perform, efficiently perform duties. Um, so I don't know that I can get into, I, I'm not aware, you know, I'm not sure about the intentional versus non-intentional, uh, but that those are the charges that the person has received. Okay. Um, I'm going to hand it back to Chairman Chuck because I know he has some follow-up questions. I may have one or two more myself, but I'll let him uh, take it from there. Thanks. Thank you, Chair Powers. And uh, for, for the, the dialogue that I think has uh, has prompted some follow-up, and then I'm going to head over to the case-by-case -case, uh, conversations. I, I just want to go back to what Ms. Grossman was, was, was kind of outlining earlier about the notification of ICE that you're technically not calling a transfer, but you're just you're just like, hey, giving them a heads up that you have someone in custody. You're going to be, you know, following the, the rules uh, that you're that you've set for yourself. 
and and how you have understood how to follow the law, but but essentially you're saying that without a judicial warrant, you are making communication happen in some way to ICE or anyone detained. Is that right? What I'm saying is that we're following um, Administrative Code Section 9-131H, which yeah. refers to use of city land or facilities by federal immigration authorities and access of persons in custody. It says that department personnel should not expend time while on duty or department resources of any kind disclosing information that belongs to the department and is, is available to them only in their official capacity. Um, best, but other than information related to a person's citizenship or immigration status, unless such response or communication, one, relates to a person convicted of a violent or serious crime or identified as a possible match in the terrorist screening debt database. Um, there are other exceptions, but that's generally the one that we rely on. So that is what we're relying on um, in terms Without of- Without a judicial warrant? Yes. Okay. Because the um, first section of the law um, that um, under um, 9131A2, uh, I'm sorry, 931A1, um, uh, that's the section of the law that has a prohibition on honoring a civil immigration container. So my understanding of that is that we can only honor, which allows for holding a person beyond the time when we would otherwise discharge them if we have a judicial warrant and if they have the qualifying conviction, they need the qualifying conviction requirement. Got it. So this is this is what we're trying to fix, right? Uh, because you're not calling it a transfer, but essentially, effectively, it's a transfer after ICE has been notified that you have someone in custody and they come and you transfer them. And, and I think this is what we're trying to fix uh, that has caused a lot of damage to the relationship with the city. And so just thank you for, for really kind of highlighting that. Um, I have um, a question about the guidance at DOC. In the internal DOC guidance titled Interactions with Federal Immigration Authorities, there are guidelines listed under procedures for inmates with immigration detainers. The guidelines state that when an inmate with an immigration detainer is otherwise eligible for release, the department shall determine which of the following actions the department shall take and list two possible actions. The first is that DOC will honor the immigration detainer if the criteria outlined in the law are met. And the second is that DOC intends to cooperate with DHS written request for advance notice of release, whether such request appears on an immigration detainer or otherwise, and cooperation in transferring custody of the inmate to DHS on the department property. As long as the person who is the subject of the request is a person convicted of a qualify qualifying crime or identified as a possible match in the terrorist screening database, and if the request is supported by specific documentation of probable cause, not a judicial warrant, a document to, documentation of probable cause, then the department will cooperate with DHS by arranging a transfer of the inmate. Are you following me here so far? I, I think I am. So, a, so practically speaking, is there a difference between DOC honoring an immigration detainer and DOC choosing to cooperate with DHS written or advance notice of release and cooperating and transferring custody of the inmate on department property? Uh, I see that as two different issues because um, as I mentioned, one is you mentioned the judicial warrant under the section that we talked about, which is that authorizes um, um, if, you have a, if, the, if we receive a judicial warrant and the person ha has a qualifying conviction, um, we are authorized under the administrative code to actually delay the discharge of a person um, so that ICE can come and pick that individual up. Um, under the other section, um, you're, you're, kind of, you're, you're referring to um, other paperwork that we receive about the ICE detainer um, that um, right. so, the, right. so, the I'm just going to pause here because I think I think we're, we're we're going through the law and we understand the law. We totally okay. understand. It's sure. the practical nature of the, of the of the action that we're reviewing today that are causing the issue. So practically, 
aren't we aren't we saying that DOC is honoring immigration detainers even without a judicial warrant? I, I would say that um, I'm you know looking at the the definition of honoring under the law. If that's what if you're using the law as the de definition of honoring, that we're delaying people so that ICE can pick de delaying discharge so that ICE can pick that person up. Um, the department's position is that we are not, um, that is not our policy. Um, what we are doing is we are um, following the section of the law that allows us to communicate when an individual has a qualifying conviction um, with ICE to let them know that we plan on discharging an individual on a particular day. Um, and that if ICE wants to um, appear uh, and pick up this individual, um, while we're simultaneously moving forward with the discharge pro process, uh, okay. we'll, we will transfer that individual. So, okay, words matter here. So I wanna, I wanna really get to a sense of this because uh, it feels a little slippery. And so I wanna, I wanna really get to a sense of this. Um, is the Department of Corrections effectuating a transfer without a judicial warrant in these cases? The, uh, we're, I, I don't, what we're calling is transfers, not, right? You're, you're transferring. So is sure. there a situation where you're transferring someone in DOC custody to ICE without a judicial warrant? Um, I'm not, we're not trying to be slippery. This is very, we're being very transparent. Uh, we are- I guess I just wanna get the answer to that question then. Help, help, I, help. I can only say that we, I can only give you the answer that, that I've been giving you that uh, when we learn that someone has a qualifying conviction we communicate with ICE. That's our policy to communicate with ICE that we have someone here who has qualified. We're going to solve that loophole with one of Councilmember uh, Powers' uh, bills, by the way. So, okay, we got that part. You're making communication because yes. the law is a little bit unclear, and, and the, the law is not tells no. the law. The law says what the law says. No, uh, and I, I get that, and that's what we're trying to fix. We're going to fix that. What I'm what I'm saying is, once that communication happens and ICE shows up onto DOC property, you are transferring. Then there is a transfer that happens with that said individual that they may or may show up, and the time you might work or not, but it happens. And so, so I just I just need you to say yes or no. DOC is effectuating a transfer without a judicial warrant to ICE on city property. Well, we're sharing information so that that and and to, that so that if an individual is about to be discharged, then ICE can pick, then ICE is able to pick them up if they're um, if they meet the qualifying conviction and they meet the requirements of the local law. So. Ah, well, no, that's the second part. They're not because a judicial warrant is what's necessary for that transfer to happen. But the transfer I, I, happens without a judicial warrant. Yes or no? I I, I would take issue with that, sir. Um, yeah, issue. I and I, I'm probably I, I take issue with that because it says here under the law that the department essentially is able to uh, communicate to ICE if a person has been convicted. Ms. Uh, Grossman, I know the law. I'm sorry, I know the law. I'm just trying to. I, this is you're not answering the question here, and I'm going to ask a follow-up question to this. Is does it happen? Has it happened that DOC is transferring an individual to ICE custody without a judicial warrant? I, I think I, I'm going to stand by my testimony, sir. I think that um, um, there. I think we've been very transparent about the process and how it is that individuals um, are discharged from our custody. Okay, uh, I'm not satisfied with this, uh, but we're going to move on to the next. My follow-up question, which is the. Uh, I guess the, the, the best way to describe this next question is how many judicial warrants, federal judicial warrants that are codified in the law as part of this detainer law uh, have been given and shown and communicated to the Department of Corrections since we have had these laws on the books since 2014. How many judicial warrants have you seen and been presented with? Um, I will say that based on the reports that we provided to the city council that we're required to provide, I understand that um, since um, October, since federal um, fiscal year 17, which covers October 16th to September 17th, 
through the city fiscal year 2020, which goes from July 19th to June 20th, uh, I mean, to June of 2020. Um, there are um, detainers lodged in the amount of 1,925. The number of individuals transferred to, to um, ICE um, are 90. Uh, so these the, are judicial, these are federal judicial warrants? No, these are detainers. Um, I, frankly, oh, I'm not- Are those administrative? Those are the, um, when we have ICE detainers, not a judicial warrant, but when we have ah, ICE- Okay, detainers. this is very clear. I don't wanna, I don't wanna confuse anyone that's watching. I'm asking for judicial warrants that are codified in the law that would sure. allow for DOC to transfer legally an individual. How many of the judicial warrants have been asked or have been presented to DOC for said, any said individual? How many? I, I will say, frankly, I'm personally not aware of many. Um, I, and I can't, any. I'm, not, I'm not aware of um, any, in the, certainly in the last um, couple of years, um, but um, it, it hasn't come to my attention. Is there anybody at the table that would know that question? Then I'm gonna hand that over to the mayor's office of immigrant affairs. but. You're, what I'm hearing you say is zero federal judicial warrants. Uh, and so is there anybody at the table there if, that- if there, was, if there was any, it would be a rare occurrence. I'm not aware that there's, I'm not aware of any in particular. If there was, it would be the rare situation where we've received them. Which, this is not a frequent- And, and what event. makes that rare? We just haven't received um, judicial warrants from generally from the federal government. We really- um, that is just not, um, we, you know, we have um, 1,925 detainers lodged. Um, yeah, well, we know detainers, you can just get them on the side of the street. I mean, that's, 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 this is the point. And, but 90 people have been transferred effectively to uh, federal enforcement without any federal judicial warrants. Is that correct? Those 90 people didn't, to my knowledge, those 90 people didn't have judicial warrants. Okay. Uh, and thank you for that. So uh, Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, Ms. Chavez, uh, are you aware of any federal judicial warrants? You're not. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. So let's move on, Ms. Chavez, to some of the other questions that we have uh, about case number two. The, the Department of Corrections claimed that client WS, and I just have to make a comment about the fact that the DOC couldn't find uh, a an initial, just with initials, because we want to do the information. They couldn't. They couldn't find it. it as if there were too many on a list uh, that were incorp uh, uh, connected to what we're trying to talk about. Violation. That's not, that's, sir, that's not true. Um, what we're saying is we were okay, not. Please And we we have a we have abbreviations um, having WS. Um, there are many people that could have different similar initials. We've done the best we could do. We think that um, the information that we have gathered is uh, what I testified to earlier. Um, and But it's subject to change if you give us the, the, the proper name. And it turns out when we look into it, it turns out it turns out to be another person with the same initials. So I respectfully take issue with the fact with what your characterization is, sir, um, over, over my testimony. OK. Well, uh, thank you for, for sharing your truth. And, and I, I still stand by, by my truth that there's, there's a problem here where we can't find uh, a, an, even an initial with some, some identifying information. And the advocates, I'll be able to engage with the advocates. And I hope you can stay here while the advocates respond to some of our back and forth about what's happening, because they're another piece of this flow of information. So I, I appreciate your, your response. And, th and thank you for sharing that. Uh, so back to the mayor's office of immigrant affairs, I want to just ask that the W case number two WS was transferred to ICE due to safety issues, even though they did not have a qualify, qualifying conviction in the last five years. Please elaborate on what safety issues existed that justified that transfer. So um, I'll just start by saying that this was not one of the cases that we had been uh, contacted on or, or were involved with. It's my understanding. And again, I will, I'll, I'll turn to DOC because they were the ones who, who gave us more details as to this case uh, after we received Well, they don't know the case on this one. So we're going to have to move on then. 
Uh, we did too. We did. Sorry, we did testify. We have number two, case number two, WS. Was, yes, we we I mentioned this earlier under case number two with WS. Um, the department received an ICE detainer on September 9th, 2017, and the individual was discharged on February 28th, 2018. The individual had a qualifying conviction for, um, and on, um, was- and What was that conviction? What was the qualifying a, conviction? A, attempted assault in the second degree. Um, the individual, um, the, the conviction was on April 28th, 2015. The individual was sentenced to five years uh, probation on April 26, 2016. And that, what was that safety issue uh, that was uh, that was presented in this case? I, I'm not. I, I'm not. I'm. I. I understand that the reason why we um, this person had a qualifying conviction, so that under the law we were we're authorized to share information. Um, so guess, we're really looking at the qualifying conviction. Uh, that's okay. how analysis from the department standpoint. So the safety issue is connected to the conviction solely and I don't I don't really know what's meant by the safety issue. I know that that's how it's characterized in the letter to the commissioner. Uh, but I know that when we looked at our facts, um, the individual met the um, had the quali what had a qualifying conviction. As a result, we that triggered the provision of the law that allows us to um, communicate with ICE. Okay, is there a way that that can get uh, discovered, the, the safety issue piece? I, I think what we're trying to figure out is where all the loopholes are and this feels like one. And so uh, is is there someone that, that we can follow up with later on just- I, I don't know that you need mind? a safety. I, I guess what I'm saying is that I don't think the law requires in this under my interpretation of the law that you require a safety issue in order to communicate with ICE. The department, communicated with ICE. My understanding is that our policy would allow the department to communicate with ICE regarding this, this situation because the individual had the qualifying conviction within the five year period. Yep. Okay, well, we'll follow up with that with that case, but thank you so much for, for that response. Uh, in case number three, please explain DOC's decision to keep SS until the expiration of their sentence SS was immediately transferred to ICE in August of 2020. Uh, so please explain how this transfer was effectuated under the law. This is case number three. Yes, this is a similar situation where the individual, um, we received an ICE detainer on January 3rd, 2020. Um, and this individual was discharged um, to um, ICE on or about July 31st, 2020 and the individual had a qualifying conviction. Uh, and that was the reason that would have been consistent with the law to allow us to communicate uh, to ICE so that they could um, come and pick this person up. Without a judicial warrant. Um, That's correct, but, with no judicial warrant. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, and I think on case two, I'm just look, reading up the notes. Um, I think we believe, for, for case two uh, WS, we, we do not believe there was a qualifying conviction there, but again, we're gonna come back to these cases as we engage. And earlier you asked uh, Chair Powers about the follow-up to the letter. We're gonna need everything in writing. So I hope you're, you're preparing for that as well as we, as we move forward. So Chair, please, Chair Benchaka, I just wanna correct it. I believe I heard DC Grossman say there was in fact a qualifying conviction for case two. For case number two, correct, case WS. Case I just wanna be clear. Both case two and case number three have qualifying convictions. Okay, and I think that's where there's discrepancy. And so we're gonna, that's for, for a later discussion, but just for the, the public note, uh, note that our information says differently. And, and so this is, this is part of this longer discussion that we're gonna have. Well, the law does say it defines a violent or serious crime and there's a list of felonies defined. And then um, there also, it talks about a felony attempt as well. Uh, so as we look at this, it, um, our view is that this fits within the, the law in terms of the qualifying conviction. And that, that gets us to where we are today. So thank you. And, and we're, gonna, we're gonna follow up with you on that. Uh, in case number six, ICE issued a non-public location within a DOC facility where they were able to transfer custody. 
uh, this type of access is described in DOC guidance. Please explain how access to non-public areas of DOC facilities is currently allowed under local law. Uh, what my, my information, um, and again, given the um, information that we have, um, we had limited information, so we did the best we could do, and we believe our information um, that we have pertains to the um, description in the letter that we received. Um, we believe, we, our understanding here is that uh, DOC received an ICE detainer on January 7th, 2021. The individual was discharged to, INN, uh, to ICE on April 23rd, 2021, and the individual had a qualifying conviction. Okay, uh, and, and it sounds like you don't have a sense of where the non-public location given to ICE was, or where that place is? I mean, I, you know, I can tell you that, I, I don't know exactly where this particular individual was discharged from, but um, I think the chief can speak mostly to the, the process of uh, when, um, similar to, yeah, uh, sorry. You're right, you're right, um, Ms. Grossman. The, the, the question can be a general one too, which is the explanation of how access to non-public areas of DOC facilities is, current is currently allowed under local law even for a transfer to ICE. Chief, do you have a sense of that? Our areas. Uh, this is Chief Stooks. Uh, Hello, Chief. Afternoon. Yes, yes. Uh, with regards to persons being uh, discharged from all of our facilities, the uh, discharge process takes place in our central intake area. Okay, so what you're saying is, I don't want to put words into your mouth, but I, I want to get a sense of this, is that ICE never goes to non-public spaces in the Department of Corrections for a transfer. That just doesn't happen, you're saying? All of our uh, discharges are released from our intakes. And that's a public area. It is not a uh, public area in a sense where there are members of the public uh, who uh, enter the area. That is a location within the facility where all of our persons who are being remanded to custody enter into a facility. And upon any discharge, that is the location in the facilities where a person is released back into the community from. Okay. We may have to follow up on that, that we're getting different information and I hope your team and staff can stay for the advocates who have a different story about that. Um, so let's move on to case number seven. And this is the last question for me that has been prepared. Uh, the Moya, the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs representatives intervened in an unlawful extended detention and were able to assist in client seven's release. Please share with Moya, uh, or actually please share what Moya communicated to the Department of Corrections that led to that release and how will DOC change its procedures moving forward to avoid that kind of situation? And just to be clear, that's for me. Well, uh, it's for, for both of you, but I, I kind of want to get that communication, what that was. So uh, Ms. Chavez, if you can talk a little bit about that communication and then DOC about how you're making efforts to make that change that doesn't happen again in case number seven. Sure, um, I, I would start by saying that I don't, our understanding of the case, looking back at what occurred in that instance, we wouldn't characterize it as our need to intervene to prevent something, it was rather uh, us being in communication with DOC to get a sense of what was happening. Um, it's our understanding and I'll let DOC speak a little bit more to the facts that the individual's release delay was delayed, but it wasn't associated with the detainer. It was it was for other factors, which I think DOC has talked about a little bit already, but again, I'll let my colleagues speak to that. Um, and then Moya worked with the Bronx Defenders Office to ensure that uh, the individual was released in compliance with the detainer. Uh, it's our understanding there was no qualifying conviction. There was never a notification that was made to ICE. Um, but beyond that, I think for the details, I would defer to my colleagues. Okay, uh, Department of Corrections. Sure, thank, thank you. So sorry, Dana, last speaking. Um, thank you, 
Hi. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner Chavez. Um, I, I actually personally remember this case very well, and I was in personally in touch with um, uh, Deputy Commissioner Chavez's staff, who called me to let me know about it, a, a delay, a release that was taking um, a bit of time, and a concern that perhaps it was related to ICE. Um, over the next few hours, I worked with my colleagues in custody management, as well as at the facility itself, to determine what was going on. Um, I was able to confirm that it was not related to an ICE detainer, um, but was unfortunately related to what we would later find out after the release was processed. Um, there was a fire in the facility that required uh, movement to stop, and that was unfortunately part of what contributed to a delayed release time. So in this case, ICE was not notified. It was not a re related to trying to detain someone for a specific, um, because of the detainer. Um, and as I believe probably Ms. Chavez and her, her staff can remember, we were in uh, communication all that night up until about 11 or 12 that night to ensure that that person came out, uh, was, was released that evening. Um, sadly, you know, we, we do run um, jail facilities. And so, uh, you know, there are certainly um, issues that can pop up that can cause can cause delays in movement across the facility and this is one of those options those times and we're always looking for ways to reduce those incidents okay uh so it sounds like there was a situation you took care of it and uh, what i haven't heard yet is whether or not you changed policies so that this this kind of delay uh doesn't happen as you saw that it was uh well thankfully it wasn't connected to it sounds like an ICE uh, attempt for transfer uh, that, that, that have you made changes within in, internal changes within the Department of Corrections that this case doesn't happen again? So with regards to the incident around that specific case, I can also say that it happened at EMTC, which is a facility that thankfully we've been able to reclose. Um, I believe it happened pretty recent, pretty close to the time we had reopened EMTC. And as a result, a number of staff members had been pulled from all over the facility to help stand up EMTC. For those who don't know, that was our uh, COVID new admission facility over the course of the second wave. And so we worked uh, certainly to make sure those staff members could work together better um, and ensure that uh, you know any issues that were, were arising because of uh, new staff coming together were resolved. Um, and then globally across the department, we are always looking at ways to address um, delays in discharge because we just as much as, as everybody watching today, we would like people to be released from jail in a timely manner as soon as it's appropriate for them to do so. We have no interest in keeping them here. But we are continuing to work on our policy and you know, always happy to work with the advocates and council to improve that as well. Beautiful. Well, I think with, with that, on that note, uh, I want to say thank you for, for your time today. Uh, we are fighting in, in the city council for New Yorkers. Uh, these are these are people who uh, deserve a sanctuary, like any New Yorker, uh, and this is why we're gonna we're going hard and we're gonna keep going hard until we fix the loopholes, uh, so that we can help you do your work uh, with more humanity and ensure that people are safe in this community. One case, it only takes one case, to destroy trust, uh, and that has happened. And we have more cases in just the last year. We're going to hear from advocates. So I'm hoping you and your team can stay and listen uh, uh, through their testimony. But it is their testimony that is driving us to fix these problems. And I hope we can come to some conclusion. Uh, but we will be using every power that we have in the council to to meet, remediate this. Uh, and and I think the, the last the last point I want to make is I hope that we can we can we can all agree that as we as we support our our, our New York neighbors that. Um, that this relationship with the federal enforcement, which is not our job, it is not the local, it's not our job as the local anything, NYPD, any city agency, including corrections, to do their job. Uh, and it is our job to build a relationship with our communities so that they can engage in COVID operations, they can engage in adult literacy programs, in job, in, 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 job, uh, in the job market. Uh, and that's what, that, that is the essence of what we're trying to protect here. Uh, and that has been damaged with them, myself, uh, and many members of, of, our, of our leadership community. So I hope to work with you to correct that. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Arbani Oja to get us to the next panel and thank uh, Chair Powers as well for, for his leadership.
Thank you, Chair. I'm just going to quickly ask if any other council members have questions for this panel. Seeing no hands, um, I'd like to thank this panel for their testimony, and we'll be moving on to our public testimony. Um, sorry, Chair, I just wanted to quickly add that um, even if you don't see uh, the four of us here, because of course, you know, our, our chief and our, our FDC, um, our general counsel need to get back to some of their other duties. Um, I am leaving members of my team um, of the intergovernmental affairs team to continue to watch and make sure that we are hearing from the senior. Beautiful. And and I guess all I would ask is that they leave their camera on uh, and engage, or not engage, but uh, just leave a camera on so we can know that they're they're here uh, present. Understood. I'll let them know. Thank you. Thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now we've concluded administration testimony and we'll be turning to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify and each panelist will be given three minutes to speak for panelists after i call your name a member of our staff will unmute you there there may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted and we thank you in advance for your patience please wait a brief moment for the sergeant at arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the zoom raise hand function and i will call on you after the panel has completed their testimony in the order in which you have raised your hands I would like to now welcome our first panel to testify. First, I will be calling on Jill Waldman, followed by Casey Del Porto, followed by Rosa Cohen Cruz, followed by Sophia Grulier, followed by Hannah Walsh, followed by Rebecca Press. Jill Waldman, you may begin your testimony when you are ready. Time starts now. Good morning. My name is Jill Baldwin, and I am the supervising attorney of the Criminal Immigration Unit at the Illegal Aid Society. The Criminal Immigration Unit provides video advice and affirmative representation to non-citizens who have had contact with the criminal justice system. Within my capacity, I have worked closely with non-citizens at Rikers Island, their lawyers, and the Department of Corrections in navigating the New York City detainer law. In 2018, I worked with a mentally ill legal permanent resident of the United States, WS. WS had prior misdemeanor convictions, which the lawyers believed to be crimes involving moral turpitude, as well as a 2014 conviction for attempted reckless assault in the second degree, a legally impossible crime, which does not carry immigration consequences, but nonetheless falls within the 177 crime carve out. WS's lawyers worked tirelessly to place WS in mental health treatment and to negotiate pleas, which maintained his eligibility for cancellation of removal, a discretionary form of relief from removal and immigration court. After extensive negotiations, WS pled guilty to, an immig to immigration safe pleas before a judge at 111 Center Street. Um, but because, uh, because WS had already served his time, he expected to be released from the courthouse. But instead, he was returned to Rikers Island, ostensibly for mental health discharge plan. Instead, he was turned over to, uh, to Immigration Customs Enforcement by the staff at Rikers Island, even though ICE did not present a, a warrant from a federal judge. The Department of Corrections justified their transfer to ICE under the communications section of the uh, New York City Detainer Law. In WS's case, DOC's coordination went well beyond communication. The department informed ICE of, his, um, of the date and time of WS's release, permitted Rikers Island, um, I, to, to our understanding, permitted ICE on Rikers Island to, uh, to arrest him, oversaw his transfer to ICE, and then reported this transfer on the Department of Corrections website. DOC's justification was that as a public safety policy, DOC had decided to ensure an orderly transfer to ICE when someone has a violent or serious felony. WS's case highlights two points. First, non-citizens who do everything possible to preserve their presence in this country through careful negotiations are still turned over to ICE under the detainer law. Second, the, um, the notification provision becomes the exception that swallows the rule. DOC is not simply informing ICE of non-citizens' release dates. They are using DOC resources and property to oversee well-coordinated transfers. If New York City is truly a sanctuary city, this council must take swift, swift and decisive action to enforce the letter and the spirit of the law and prohibit DOC from using this notification as well. Thank you. 
Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome PC Del Porto to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Casey Del Porto. I'm a policy attorney at New York County Defender Services. And before joining NYCDS, I, wor I worked as a criminal immigration specialist at the Legal Aid Society with Ms. Waldman. Um, and I am here to tell the story of a client that I represented there. Um, who in March 2020 was, um, was the victim of a violation of the NYC detainer law and was ultimately transferred to ICE and deported. My client, who I will call SS, was born in Gambia and had lived in the United States since 2014. He was married to a U.S. citizen who was born and raised in the Bronx, and they had two young children together. Um, in March 2020, he was serving a sentence on Rikers Island for two Class E nonviolent felony offenses, attempted reckless endangerment in the first degree, and attempted reckless assault in the second degree. On March 26, 2020, as New York City plunged into lockdown, I got a frantic call from SS's wife, Rachel. She said that SS had just called her and told her that he was going to be picked up by ICE. She said that around 11 a.m. that morning on March 26, he was given um, instruction that he was on Mayor de Blasio's list of individuals to be released early due to the coronavirus pandemic that was spiraling out of control across the city and especially in um, DOC correctional facilities. Um, so as instructed, he immediately packed up his belongings, went to discharge planning um, at RNDC. He said that when he arrived there and as he was going through the paperwork, the deputy corrections officer who was in charge of discharge planning came up to him and said, quote, you're not going home, you're going back to Africa, ICE is coming to get you. This corrections officer then sent him back to his cell for ICE pickup, that's when he called his wife and also me. So immediately alarm bells rang because this seemed to confirm our suspicion that um, DOC was not in fact just notifying ICE um, when somebody presented with a qualifying conviction. In fact, they were delaying, stalling and prolonging that person's detention until ICE um, had arrived and then they would facilitate the transfer. So I immediately called the ICE captain on duty, Captain Rainey. Um, she informed me, in, in fact, very frankly, that that was exactly what she planned to do, that she said in her words, she was going to honor the detainer and she was not releasing my client until ICE had an opportunity to show up and arrest him. Um, so I immediately escalated the matter and I spoke to do see legal um, specifically I spoke to Lauren Mello, who um, seemed to understand that this was a violation in fact of DOC law, um, and so she, um, she said she would look into the matter. Um, I, after many follow-up emails, voicemails, unresponded text messages, about 24 hours later, I received an email from uh, Kevin Hayes, a corrections officer, who confirmed again that they were going to hold my client until the time that it took for, do, for ICE to arrive and pick him up. Anyway, there's, there was a lot more back and forth, and I'll rely on my written testimony for those details, but my client time expired. was... My client was ultimately, um, he was transferred to ICE custody through the coordination of DOC, sorry, um, and he was deported. Um, this, his wife is now without a husband, his children are without a father. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Rosa Cohen-Cruz to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Thank you. Uh, my name is Rosa Kunkers, and I am an immigration attorney and policy counsel to the Bronx Defenders Immigration Practice. Uh, the detainer laws were enacted to stem the arrest and deportation pipeline and insert some measure of due process by requiring a judicial warrant before transferring someone with a qualifying conviction to DHS custody. So I'm going to focus specifically and quickly on two of the most common violations we see. First are transfers without a judicial warrant, and the other excessive detention and lack of transparency around um, when DOC is trying to determine whether or not a detainer can be honored. So DOC testified today that they do not believe any transfers other than Javier Castillo Madriaga's have been in violation of the detainer law, but they also confirmed that there have been no judicial warrants in any of the cases where individuals have gone from their custody into ICE's custody. Their response is that they're merely notifying ICE of when a person will be released, but that is false. It also flies against the intent and spirit of the judicial requir warrant requirement in the detainer law. In March of this year, a Bronx defender's client finished a six month sentence on Rikers Island after a conviction for a violent or serious crime. Um, and he was informed by DOC staff that he was going to be released. But on that same day, he was taken from his housing area to wait in a separate holding cell. He waited for two hours without any explanation from ICE. 
and two ICE officers went into his cell and told him that they were going to follow him. He then was informed outside of the cell that he was being arrested by ICE and was transported from DOC custody to ICE custody. There was, we have never received, nor has he ever received any, any accounting of the time that he was held in the holding cell. Um, no judicial warrant was ever presented to DOC. He never had one moment of liberty between his time in DOC custody and his time in ICE custody. Moreover, we're just left to guess at why our client was held for two hours. Was it the normal course of discharge or a delay tactic? This is a consistent theme that we see in all of our cases and it has allowed DOC to continue to escape accountability. Um, no judicial warrant, uh, sorry. Um, similarly, in August of 2019, a BXC client with a qualifying condition was arrested by ICE, conviction was arrested by ICE without a judicial warrant in his own housing unit at Rikers. Both of these clients were transferred to ICE without a judicial warrant under the guise of responding for request, to a request for notification. Both of these clients never had a minute of liberty. And again, a judicial warrant was never presented. Um, and we see any transfer of custody, the fact that someone never has this moment of liberty between their custody in DOC and their custody of ICE is clearly flies in the face of the intent behind the, the judicial warrant requirement and the detainer law and eviscerates any of the protections the law was meant to confer. Um, DOC's guidance in March of 2019 that they do not require a judicial warrant for individuals as long as they're not, those people are not detained beyond the time it takes to complete the discharge process is, I'm expired. is meaningless without any accounting for the actual discharge process. We heard today that, and I'll be quick in finishing, we heard today that it will be difficult, it would be too difficult for DOC to differentiate cases in which an individual is held for an extended period of time for an immigration detainer versus those where they're just held for other factors. It is up to DOC. They are the ones responsible for detailing any reason that a person is being detained beyond the normal time. And how are we as advocates or our clients incarcerated in these systems supposed to hold DOC accountable if they are not even accounting for the time that it takes to um, for somebody to be released? You know, our belief is that they are often using delay tactics in order to allow DOC ICE to come to the facility and pick up our clients. And that is what we see time after time under the guise of responding to a request for notification. I'm just gonna quickly share one last story, which is that in, in 2017, I myself went to Rikers and asked to meet with a client. I knew he was being released that day. I knew there was an ICE hold and I told DOC I was coming to meet with him. I got there at nine o'clock in the morning and waited until 2 p.m. in the afternoon. I was sent, I spoke to five or six different officers throughout the day. I was sent back and forth from different buildings, told to speak with different officers, told to sit and wait. And eventually after waiting for four hours, I was told my client had been released to ICE custody during the time I had been at the facility and never, and he was never given an opportunity to speak to me, his lawyer. I see DOC putting their obligation to, their interest in working with ICE above their obligations to the people in their custody, above, the obligation to release people under the Tainer law above the obligation to allow people the right to counsel. We cannot allow DOC's allegiances to ICE to override their allegiances to New Yorkers, regardless of those New Yorkers' immigration status. Um, for all, the one last thing I'll mention is that this is an issue statewide. We recently had a client in Putnam County who was complying with probation every day, doing everything he was supposed to do, checking in, and that probation officer told ICE to come and pick him up at his next scheduled appointment. And for that reason, in addition to all of the other measures that um, are on the table for today, it is very important that the council pass a resolution calling on New York state legislator to pass New York for all, um, because we need to see this problem fixed both in the city level and on the state level. New York state should not be in the business of collaborating with ICE and um, funneling people into the deportation pipeline. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Sophia Gurule to testify. You may begin when you are ready. It starts now. And NIFA Public Defender and Policy Counsel to the Immigration of the Bronx Defenders. This is the first oversight hearing of New York City's detainer laws, which were passed during the Obama administration in 2014. And here we are, a Trump and Biden administration later, because the New York Police Department and Department of Corrections are consistently failing to comply with laws imposed on them to protect immigrant New Yorkers from deportation. The reason the detainer laws were passed seven years ago is because it was a fact that arrests and jailing by NYPD and DOC systematically led to immediate arrest by ICE. This was the reality. 
partly due to draconian and unjust federal immigration law enforcement, and partly due to the fact that NYPD and DOC readily shared information and communicated with ICE. Responsive to the communities that represent, they represented who demanded more protection for immigrant New Yorkers, the city council stepped up and passed groundbreaking legislation to limit the city's cooperation with ICE. Yet seven years later, the fact remains the same. NYPD and DOC share information and communicate with ICE. And this, is, this collaboration is actually codified in limited circumstances where there are exceptions that instruct that people with certain violent or seminal criminal convictions can have their information shared or even be transferred into ICE custody so long as ICE has obtained a warrant signed by a federal judge. In other words, if a person has a certain type of criminal conviction, then they are considered categorically expendable regardless of whether that person has fulfilled their punitive jail sentence or in other instances were forced to plead guilty to unduly harsh criminal charges due to countless systemic barriers that result in the hypercriminalization of poor Black, Indigenous, and Latinx communities. But though some city collaboration with ICE is codified, much of the recent NYPD and DOC cooperation with ICE is tr strictly prohibited by the city's detainer laws. As my colleagues have detailed before me, there have been countless instances of DOC notifying and transferring immigrant New Yorkers into ICE custody, even though they have not, they can't account for one instance where ICE has actually produced a judicial warrant signed by a federal judge. The idea that ICE would obtain a judicial warrant signed by a federal judge to make an ICE arrest is actually just laughable. It's simply unheard of. It's unheard of because agencies like NYPD and DOC are notoriously opaque and refuse to share this information with people in their custody and with their attorneys. It's also laughable because ICE cares even less to honor fundamental due process protections. So the issue is not whether they collaborate with ICE. The issue is how to ensure DOC and NYPD compliance with the city's detainer laws and how to strengthen the laws. Any, any immigrant New Yorker being subjected to the terror of ICE with the assistance of NYPD and DOC is unacceptable. A city agent's violation of our detainer laws demonstrates a flagrant disregard for our laws, an egregious misuse of our city's resources, and makes a mockery of New York City's best efforts to be a sanctuary for immigrants. We have to end the 177 conviction carve-outs to our existing laws, they're dehumanizing, they result in family separation, and it's simply not the responsibility of city agencies to facilitate federal deportation, regardless of a person's criminal conviction. We need to close all the loopholes that allow for a city agency to communicate with ICE, and the city council must urge New York City State's legislature to pass the New York Brawl Act, which would strengthen our city's detainer laws if passed. And we need to pass a private right of action because the only consequences that agencies like NYPD or DOC seem to understand involves money. Immigrant New Yorkers and their families should be able to sue the city for violating, violating the detainer laws and seek civil damages for being subjected to the terrors of ICE enforcement and our nation's deportation courts, which have only become more dysfunctional and punitive in the past four years. Being a sanctuary for immigrant New Yorkers is an ongoing commitment and requires us learning and refining our collective efforts to protect our most vulnerable community members. We simply can't hand any immigrant New Yorker over to the federal deportation machine due to dehumanizing categor categorizations based on criminal legal system contact. Immigrant New Yorkers were the frontline caretakers and workers who showed up day in and day out for New York City in its toughest months of the pandemic at the same time that the federal government cowered in its support for our city. Immigrant New Yorkers are also from the same Black and Indigenous communities disproportionately policed due to anti-Black racist policing practices and from communities routinely divested from and ignored. And as the Biden administration reshapes and finalizes its, its, its immigration law enforcement priorities in the coming weeks, now is the critical moment to make New York City's values known. New York City unequivocally stands with all immigrant New Yorkers and we refuse to cooperate with a punitive and carceral deportation machine that dehumanizes people based on their contact with the criminal legal system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Hannah Walsh to testify. You may begin when you are ready. All right, who starts now? Good afternoon, my name is Hannah Walsh. I'm a staff attorney at the Bronx Defenders and I will be reading a statement by a client of the Bronx Defenders. I entered a jail in New York City after pleading guilty in a criminal case against me. Throughout my criminal case, I attended every hearing and communicated with my criminal defense attorney. My criminal defense attorney never told me that the conviction I pled to could lead me to be arrested by ICE. One day in April, 2021, I was told by the officers at the jail that I was going to be released. They then called me down to the cell to wait for release. 
I waited two hours in a cell close to the part where people are released from the jail. After waiting around one hour in the cell, I noticed two officers who were in the room outside of the cell. I later learned that these officers worked for ICE, but I did not know this when I first saw them. They were there for around one hour while I waited for my release. They were speaking with the corrections officers or the COs. After waiting for about another hour, one of the ICE officers opened the door to my cell and asked for me by name. I said yes, and he signaled that I should come with them. Upon leaving the cell, I entered the room of the jail where people leaving jail can pick up their clothing and property. There were two COs there and two officers who I believe were captains because they were wearing white shirts. The two officers I had seen from my cell and that had come to get me were also there. When I entered the room, these officers told me that they were from immigration and that I had to go with them. They also wore hats that said ICE. The ICE officers did not speak much Spanish, so one of the COs translated for us. ICE gave me my clothing and ordered me to change my clothes. Now understanding that ICE was going to arrest me, I asked them why they were arresting me. They did not answer me. I told them, I want to speak to my lawyer. One of the ICE officers responded to me in Spanish and told me, relax, relax, you're going to have a lawyer. This calmed me down a little bit in the moment because I thought I would be able to call a lawyer. But in fact, they did not allow me to speak to a lawyer that day. The jail officers took my fingerprints and gave me pa a paper to sign. I did not know what the paper said because it was all in English. Then the ICE officers handcuffed my wrists and ankles connected by a chain on my waist. It was very difficult to walk and this hurt my arm a lot. When we finally left the jail, I believe between two to three hours had passed since I was first called down to wait. From there, ICE transferred me to Manhattan where I was processed and transported to ICE, an ICE detention facility where I remain today. I had no idea that I was going to be arrested by ICE. I thought I was complying with everything I needed to do for my criminal case, and I was supposed to begin probation upon release. Being in ICE detention has been very difficult for me, and it has had a big impact on my family. At home, I support my partner and her child emotionally and financially. I also support my mother, who is getting older and has health problems. It has now been six months since I have been able to see my loved ones. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Rebecca Press to testify. You may begin when you are ready. It starts now. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Rebecca Press and I'm the legal director of Unlocal, a community-centered nonprofit organization that provides community education, outreach, and legal representation to New York City's immigrant communities. We are part, uh, a critical part of the team that represents Mr. Castillo Maradiaga in his legal case. I know that we have spent a long time talking about Mr. Castillo's case, but I am going to revisit it because his case demonstrates all of the ways in which our current detainer laws fail. Um, first and foremost, the current detainer laws fail in so many ways, as we've heard. The fact that the laws do not regulate the kind of communication between ICE and city agencies, the extent, when, how, does they don't require that, they, that this communication be made publicly available is shocking. We heard from Moya earlier this morning that they don't even track these communications. How are we even to know where to begin if we don't know what kind of commu communication is occurring? We believe that the, that the detainer laws should be amended to prohibit all communication between city agencies and ICE. That would go a long way in ensuring that the kind of error that occurred with Javier never occurs again. But short of that, absent that, at, a, at the very least, the detainer laws must be amended to ensure and regulate the communication between city agencies and ICE. And, that, and those communications must be made publicly available quickly. There's no reason that a full year passed between Javier's arrest or transfer and when it became publicly known. The other way in which the detainer law currently fails uh, is Frank, the, the, the choice to absolve the city from all responsibility when these grievous, er grievous errors occur. And by that, I'm referring to the lack of a public, uh, of a private cause of action. The detainer law must be amended to include a private right of action. You know, we heard Moya talk about all the efforts that they made to mitigate um, this horrible error that occurred, this horrible violation of the law that occurred. And 
while we appreciate those efforts, um, truly Javier's case shows clearly that once an error like this occurs, once a violation of the law like this occurs, there's very little that the city can do to mitigate the harm, right? We appreciate everything is done, that was done, but the reality is that Javier was released from ICE detention because of tremendous community action, because of all of the legal work that, that went into it, right? And the reality is that he was released on an exceedingly thin margin. It just as well could have gone the other way. And it has gone the other way with many of the clients of, of my colleagues, right? And then what? And then what? The, the mitigating efforts are far too so, so we fully support a private cause of action and we request that the detainer laws be amended even further to prohibit all communication between ICE and city agencies. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'm now going to turn it to Chairman Chaka for questions. Time starts now. Uh, thank you, Rebecca, Sophia, Hannah, all of the folks that are, that, rep that either testified on their own behalf in their organizations or testified with testimony from people who have been impacted. Your voices matter. Your voices are what is driving so much of this hearing and what we want to do to fix the issues. Uh, and, and I just want to do and we have so many folks that are wanting to testify, so I don't want to spend too much time, but I do want to hit on two pieces. Um, for the WS case, uh, the there was a discrepancy with the DOC labeling the crime uh, within the de Blasio carve out of the 177 crimes and and our information that we have received from all of you. Can you can you offer your rendition? And as you do that, I'm going to ask for the DOC and the Moya representatives who are here today to turn on their cameras for the rest of this hearing. Um, I hope that's not a lot to ask. And if that's a lot to ask, let me know. Uh, I think that's fair uh, for you to be here to listen and witness and, and uh, be with us in your presence. And so um, at that point, or can I hand it over to Ms. Wallman? Or is it Ms. Wallman that you were talking about WS, right? Okay. Um, just the 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 discrepancy that, that was uh, confronted, we were confronted by DOC's information. And can you just help us clarify that? Sure. I, 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 I fear that something got lost in translation. WS did have an attempted reckless felony assault, um, which is a, um, the assault two statute is uh, on the 177 um, carve out. Um, it is, however, a legally impossible crime, and so it was immigration. It was something where a um, very well-intentioned attorney had attempted to um, negotiate a immigration-safe plea, um, and yet still was um, was considered a, a danger under the um, under the detainer law. But um, he was convicted of a crime that was uh, under the, uh, the 177 carve out. We can sort of uh, discuss whether the, the attempts uh, should be um, included in those um, in that, uh, that those violent or serious crime categories, but um, that that is correct. And I apologize if the wrong impression was. was uh, I, this is just to clarify, you know, so this is this is part of what we do here and ensure that the right information is, is correct. Uh, I, have, I have yet to see or understand if we have Moya and DOC on the line. So I want to make sure that that happens. Um, and a question for Sophia, uh, who is one of the defenders who has been really pushing this uh, conversation forward, but also on the ground defending, uh, utilizing the, the contract through the New York Immigrant Family Unity Project that is now a, a, a national model for other municipalities to bring representation. Uh, Sophia, you, you represent the uh, the kind of force on the ground that is paid for by the city of New York to defend and offer uh, legal assistance for anyone that finds themselves in a deportation proceeding. And I just want to get a sense from you about how you feel that the city is paying for legal representation while the city is also offering these very dangerous communications uh, without a judicial warrant, violating the spirit of the law. And I just want to get a sense from you about how you're feeling and representing the defenders that are, are defending while we're also causing this massive uh, humanitarian issue right here in our city.
if we can unmute Sophia, there we go. Thank you. Um, I mean, it's incredibly frustrating. It's incredibly frustrating to hear DOC officials and Moya officials, you know, try to obfuscate what the law is. It's incredibly frustrating to hear them say that they basically have not received one signed federal judicial warrant as required under the law. And yet there's so many instances that we see, you know, basically fairly regularly. I mean, I'm not kidding when I say that it is laughable to us that there would ever be a signed judicial warrant um, filed with any of these agencies. And of course, it's like inconsistent with the ways that the New York City, that New York City is trying to be an actual sanctuary for immigrant New Yorkers. Why are we allowing these different agencies to use our money, <laughs> the money from immigrant communities and all New Yorkers to facilitate federal deportations while at the same time we're trying to defend immigrant New Yorkers from the draconian immigration law enforcement and the draconian immigration courts that are becoming increasingly, you know, kind of, for lack of a better phrase, cesspools of due process. I mean, we are constantly operating in those courts and when we try to raise these issues within the courts themselves, there's very little concern. So being able to fight this at, from the front end and ensure compliance is really of the utmost importance because there are very limited, limited circumstances where we can actually find a remedy for the people who are harmed by these decisions, let alone fight their deporta deportation cases because of it. Thank you. I just wanted to really give you a sense of, of um, or the opportunity anyway, to give us a sense of how you're feeling on the ground as our defenders. You're the ones that we call when we find out that there is a deportation situation happening when the breadwinner has been pulled from a home and is now, uh, the whole family is now in disarray. And many times we win that and sometimes we don't. Uh, and so this is what's at stake here. So I just wanna say thank you for that. Uh, we still do not have a Moya or DOC representative, as I understand. I'm going to need you to, uh, and if not, please let us know what the issue is, uh, whether um, or not there's a problem. But I still, not, I still don't hear that there is a Moya representative listening to the rest of this testimony or from the DOC, which we're going to be following up with you later. Uh, so just noting that. Uh, okay, that's it for me. Chair Powers, do you have any questions? Okay. No, but I appreciate uh, everyone's testimony and giving us a sense of what is happening here with your clients and uh, adding sort of a level of urgency here to some of the work we're doing in this hearing. So thanks so much. Thank you, chairs. I'm just going to quickly ask if any other council members have questions for this panel. Seeing none, I'm going to thank this panel for their testimony and we'll be moving on to our next public panel. Um, next, I will be calling on Itzel Corona Aguilar, followed by Kiki Tapiero, followed by Pramila Cotopali. Um, Itzel Corona Aguilar, you may begin your testimony when you are ready. Time starts now. Uh, my name is Itzel Corona Aguilar, and I'm the paralegal organizer for Unlocals Rapid Response Legal Collaborative. Uh, the RRLC is a partnership between Unlocal, Make the Road, and NILAC, and it was created to provide critical legal support for individuals, families, and communities that are at high risk of deportation. I will be uh, reading a testimony from a New York resident named Mario Lopez. Quote, I, Mario Lopez, give testimony on behalf of my companions. I was detained for 15 months in Hudson County and I was able to meet several people who arrived at this place due to a previous arrest by the New York police. I ask that the police not work with ICE. If a resident makes a mistake, they have to be accountable, but not with ICE. No one should have to be caged and separated from their children. I met many who were deported just because they were arrested by the NYPD. The police pass the individual's information to ICE and people who do not have documents to live in this country are wrongfully impacted." End quote. While managing Unlocal's Rapid Response Legal Collaborative Hotline for the past year and a half, it has become increasingly clear that most, if not all people who reach our services have had an encounter with the NYPD shortly before being detained by ICE 
particularly Black, Indigenous, Muslim, trans, and queer migrants who experience and targeted police on a regular basis. Many of these stories I hear speak to the precarity and lack of support that undocumented immigrants experience even within a sanctuary city like New York. Although undocumented communities often refrain from calling the police, many are forced to do so after they've experienced significant harm, and rather than receiving direct support, are instead targeted by the police who go on to share this information with ICE. ICE then takes over and ensures the individual is detained and eventually deported. Approximately 99.9% .9 of the time, ICE does not have a judicial warrant to detain individuals. At a local, we provide educational support by empowering undocumented communities to know their rights and verify what a judicial warrant looks like. While this information is invaluable to immigrant New Yorkers, we know that ICE um, and NYPD continue to violate detainer laws in order to maintain white supremacist ideals of who is deserving of processing their immigration case outside of captivity. The seven cases that have been highlighted at this council meeting today are specifically related to scenarios where severe harm has been caused. I want to emphasize that these numbers are actually much higher, but the realities of captivity and deportation limit a transparent understanding of the historical and continued collaboration happening between ICE and the New York Police Department. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Kiki Tapiero to testify. You may begin when you are ready. He starts now. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kiki Tapiero. I'm a staff attorney at the Bronx Defenders, and I'm sharing the story of my client, Rogelio, who is not able to be here today. He has given me permission to share his story. I had served my time of one year at Rikers Island, but following completion of my sentence, I was removed from my cell and placed in an intake room for 30 minutes while DOC and ICE coordinated my transfer into ICE custody. At the time, I didn't understand what was happening. They only spoke to me in English. I was not given a warrant or anything signed by a judge. I was not told my rights in a language I could understand. I was confused because I thought I was being released and I should have been released. Instead, I was brought to 26 Federal Plaza for several hours and then transferred to Hudson County Jail. Later, I learned through my attorney that ICE placed a detainer hold on me and DOC complied with ICE. At Hudson County Jail, the unlivable conditions drove me to go on hunger strike. At the time that I was on strike, there were at least 80 people infected with COVID because of lack of proper quarantine. I was then transferred to Orange County Jail in January 2021, where I continued my hunger strike. The cell I was placed in was cold and dirty, and like Hudson, OCJ, failed to adequately protect its inmates against the COVID-19 virus. I also experienced racism and harassment from many of the guards who abused their power over the inmates. I was treated even worse than a zoo animal. I had to eventually stop the strike because of the toll it took on my body. My eyes and my head in particular were in a lot of pain. My first meal after my hunger strike was a small portion of hard bread and very watery pasta that was practically soup. I tried to buy more food from the commissary but they often double or triple the prices. This is what happens when prisons are a business. Fortunately, I was released in March, but that is not always the case for everyone transferred into ICE custody. Some people wait many more months or even years before eventually being released, or sometimes the story ends in a deportation. More laws like New York for All Act must be passed to better protect our New Yorkers. And DOC and ICE must also be held accountable to follow the law. There is no point in making legal progress when policies are simply ignored by enforcement officials. This willful ignorance is a blatant act of white supremacy and a continuation of the US's legacy of violence against black, indigenous, and other people of color. Let's do better in New York City. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Pramila Kotopali to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Hi, um, my name is Pramila and I'm a volunteer for Freedom for Immigrants um, and I'm here to read um, for Brian for Carla. Um, he was on this call earlier, but he had to leave because of work. Um, so I will be reading off the translation of his testimony um, word for word. Um, quote, good morning. My name is Brian Vergara. First, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak with you all and for listening to my testimony and that of my peers who went through the process. I've lived in the US for five years. Both my daughter and wife live in this country. In 2018, I arrived at court for the first time in my life. 
When I arrived at court, my attorney told me not to pay bail. He said that even though it was only $300, if I paid the bail, ICE would pick me up within 72 hours. I endured three months in jail until something happened at the Supreme Court. I was told that I could leave the jail because ICE was no longer allowed to arrest immigrants at jails. When I got out of the jail, I had to do probation for three years. On September 24, 2020, upon leaving an appointment I had with my probation officer, I was arrested by five heavily armed ICE agents. They tied me up in chains on my feet, my waist, and my hands. Then they moved me directly to Hudson County, New Jersey. When I arrived at Hudson, I realized that a lot of the, of the detainees around me were also handed over to ICE by the NYPD. Most people at Hudson were transferred there from Rikers Island. I watched more than five people arrive at Hudson after spending five days at Hudson. Then five days later, I saw those people were also sent back to Rikers Island. I don't know what the motive was to do this, but they did it many times. I was detained at Hudson County for five months. During that time, I saw that many of my peers were wasting their time and life inside the jail for no reason. I say this because the NYPD arrests many immigrants for no reason. They invent charges, then they bring people before a judge on the very unjust charges that the police made up. Many of the people I was detained with were deported, leaving their families here in New York. Many of them signed order for uh, many of them signed orders for voluntary departure because we were detained during the pandemic, and the conditions we lived in were quite de deplorable. We were not well fed. We spent 23 and a half hours a day inside the cells. There were two people with epilepsy who suffered seizures in one unit. The guards responded by placing handcuffs on their feet and hands when really they should have taken the person to see a doctor. And this isn't even to mention the discrimination we suffered from the guards. We must endure the lies that ICE agents tell and we also have to deal with the suffering caused by being away from our families. I think the NYPD should not collaborate with ICE since their agents have no criteria to arrest people. ICE doesn't care that children have to spend so much time away from their mothers or fathers. Moreover, the process people must go through is excessively unjust. There's no justice in keeping jails full solely for the sake of keeping them open. They don't care if we die inside. And I will remind you that in 2020, 21 immigrants died in ICE custody. And it's truly sad to see how many families are separated because of the racist and xenophobic beliefs held by people with the power to, to incarcerate others. I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak so that, so that it is known by the public how many immigrants are mistreated by immigration authorities. Thank you very much, end quote. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, I'll turn it to Chairman Chaka for any questions. Thank you. These cases are just so heartbreaking. And I think the one, maybe the one question that really illustrates the situation, I think it was Rogelio's case. Uh, Kiki, if you can get back on to the, to the Zoom, um, you walked us through the, really like the, the whole timeline of what what had happened. Uh, there was a finished sentence, I understand, and that I just want to connect the dots here that the essentially the what's the word I want to use the conviction, the conviction that led I want to make a, a connection here. <laughs> Bear with me. That there's a conviction that led to jail time of a year. And I'm assuming, and you can correct me, that conviction is what tipped the 175 crimes. Is that right? Um, yeah, that's correct. Okay. So this New Yorker paid for, through the justice system, crime for the conviction. Conviction happened, time in jail. And as soon as that was over, ICE without, or, or I guess ICE without a federal judicial warrant got a transfer from DOC and that led to the deportation proceeding. Yes, that's all correct. This, this is even, I mean, this is the greater injustice of, 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 I think all of these cases, but this is just one of those lines where you have to meet where someone has paid their price on a conviction even though it was in the 177 and they should be allowed to leave and then, and they did not. And that's what we're talking about here. So just thank you. I just want to, everyone who's listening and how we're, how we're thinking about it and what we're trying to fix here. Uh, this is wrong. This is wrong. Thank you. Thank you, Kiki. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you for highlighting that. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, Chair Powers, any questions? Okay. Um, I will quickly ask if there are any other council members that have questions at this time. Seeing no hands, um, I'd like to thank this panel for their testimony and we'll be moving on to our next panel. In order, I will be calling on Catherine Gonzalez, followed by Jenia Blaser, followed by Lindsay Nash, followed by Luba Cortez, followed by Zachary Ahmed. Catherine Gonzalez, you may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. My name is Catherine Gonzalez. I'm a senior staff attorney and policy counsel in the immigration practice at Brooklyn Defender Services. I thank the Committee on Immigration and Committee on Criminal Justice, in particular, Chairman Chaka and Chair Powers, for the opportunity to testify today. In my time at BDS, as both a criminal defense attorney and an attorney in the immigration practice, I have witnessed firsthand the direct harmful results of the entanglement between the criminal and immigration legal systems. An entanglement that results in immigrant New Yorkers, as um, has been pointed out today, being treated unequally. ICE has long relied on local and state law enforcement to target, arrest, and deport people, tearing people from their families and our communities. What we are seeing is essentially a fluid transfer of custody between DOC and ICE under the purview of the notification exception. Whether there is a violation of the detainer laws is a question BDS cannot answer because there is a lack of transparency. We do not have information about the actual communications between DOC and ICE. We do not know whether our clients for whom DOC receives an ICE detainer are released after the same amount of time as a client with no ICE detainer. The 2014 detainer laws were a critical step in the right direction, and we applaud the council's leadership in forging them. However, immigrant communities continue to face an enormous threat in an era of increased surveillance and enforcement. The city can and should do more to ensure that residents are not unnecessarily targeted for detention and deportation because of some action or failure to act by the city. In our written testimony, we offer a number of recommendations, including the elimination of the notification exception to the detainer laws and a requirement for all DOC, NYPD, and the Department of Probation to inform defendants or people who are our clients and defense counsel of a detainer or a request for notification from ICE and to provide both our clients and uh, us as their counsel, a copy of the detainer of whatever request for notification they receive and any accompanying information issued by federal law enforcement to DOC, NYPD, or, D or DOP. In our testimony, we share the unfortunate story of our NIFAP client, Juan Cruz Mestizo, a Brooklyn resident for over 30 years and a beloved father and grandfather. Mr. Cruz Mestizo tragically died after contracting COVID-19 on Rikers Island. This Friday, June 11th of 2021, will be the tragic one-year anniversary of his unnecessary death. And we believe that his story exemplifies the tragic and sometimes fatal consequences of the entanglement between these systems. The past seven years that our city's law enforcement agencies have relied on the notification, as, if I may finish, as a loophole to allow for back channel entanglement, with the federal mass deportation regime. And we urge the city council to close this loophole that targets our immigrant communities. To, meaning, to meaningfully work towards making New York City the sanctuary city we believe it to be, the city council must use its authority to prioritize the safety and needs of immigrant New Yorkers over the discretionary powers of our city's various law enforcement agencies. I thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Jenia Blaser to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Hi, um, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Jenia Blazer and I'm a senior staff attorney with the Immigrant Defense Project. I'm testifying in support of the laws and the New York for All resolution introduced today. IDP is a New York-based nonprofit that works to minimize the harsh and disproportionate immigration consequences of contact with the criminal legal system. In an effort to limit the damage that ICE surveillance and policing wreaks on New York communities, IDP has long advocated to end the entanglement between the criminal legal system and ICE. 
The first New York City detainer law was passed in 2011 on the premise that immigrant New Yorkers should be protected from the overreaching arm of ICE. This law was passed while ICE was aggressively implementing its secure communities program nationally, which effectively transformed the local police precinct into a notification system for ICE. Over the past decade, ICE has further embedded itself in the criminal system, requiring cities like New York to come up with policies to limit the harms of ICE's looming presence in our city. One goal of passing a detainer law was to send a clear message that an arrest by NYPD should not be a pipeline to ICE detention and deportation. The current version of New York City's detainer law falls short of this message and the original premise because of the carve outs. At the time it passed, IDP and others raised concerns about having any carve out in a law intended to cut off the arrest to deportation channel and protect immigrant New Yorkers. Advocates pointed out how the carve out feeds into ICE's false rhetoric that some immigrants are perpetual threats to public safety and therefore disposable under our sanctuary policies. In response to this concern, the judicial warrant requirement for cooperation was added to further due process for immigrant New Yorkers, but the carve out and allowance for ICE notification even without a judicial warrant remained part of the law. As the first part of this hearing covered in detail, the judicial warrant requirement has been circumvented by allowing notification between DOC and ICE under the carve out. It has become increasingly clear that carve outs have led to a system, systematic, systemic problem of, ICE, of DOC communication with and notification to ICE that is against the spirit of the detainer law. DOC and Moya have failed to provide any clear answers about this. As Moya testified today, they have no oversight or access to communications between DOC and ICE. IDP, Baji, and the New York uh, Immigrant Rights Clinic had to litigate a foil with DOC after we requested documents related to communication and collaboration between DOC and ICE. After finally receiving nearly a, a thousand pages of production, uh, we're starting to analyze uh, what we received. But even at first glance, it demonstrates how DOC officials are extremely collegial with ICE, and that despite the testimony here today, they are eager to discuss cases with ICE prior to case resolution solution or to an individual's release from custody, and that DOC officials hold animus towards immigrant New Yorkers, including describing their support of deporting immigrants. I'm expired. The current detainer law has proven to enable officials to skirt the law and act on their personal beliefs. It is evident that DOC has helped facilitate ICE's transfer of some immigrant New Yorkers as a result of the carve out. As we've heard today, there is no transparency or public protocol about how the city responds when violations occur or DOC helps facilitate individuals into the hands of ICE. The secrecy and lack of communication on this issue has an irreparable impact on immigrant New Yorkers who find themselves in ICE's crosshairs after coming into contact with NYPD. Once someone has been arrested by ICE, they face deportation regardless of whether cities, the city's agencies misinterpreted or violated our local detainer law. There's no going back once ICE has been brought into the picture. By approving circumstances in which DOC can collaborate with ICE, New York City's current detainer law carve-outs fall short of the promise of sanctuary to immigrant New Yorkers. The very existence of this policy is a codification of a list uh, of people New York City Council has deemed to be disposable, of immigrants against whom the city's distaste for ICE is thrown to the side. The city's role in extending deporta the deportation pipeline into our communities by way of the detainer law exceptions must end. New York City can do better. We must take additional actions to make clear that the criminal, legal, and immigration systems stand separate and apart from one another. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Lindsay Nash to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. My name is Lindsay Nash. I'm a clinical professor and the co-director of the Catherine O. Greenberg Immigration Justice Clinic at Cardozo Law. Today's hearing and, and the legislation proposed at it serve as recognition of the critical nature of city laws that seek to disentangle city functions from federal immigration enforcement. You can see that these laws have been incredibly impactful in limiting the city's work with ICE and in protecting many community members. But these laws are far from perfect. They contain some significant loopholes and gaps that mean that city officers continue to turn New Yorkers over to ICE and they do so largely with impunity. Others have spoken today about the importance of the legislation the council is proposing now and the grave harms that result when these laws are violated. 
So I'm going to focus on the bill that would provide a private right of action for certain violations of the city's detainer laws. This bill is really important because it recognizes the need for accountability when local officers violate these laws, and it seeks to place the power to hold these officers accountable in the hands of those who've been harmed. This is something that as the violations described today make all too clear is sadly critical. Now this legislation is extremely as an extremely important first step, but to make this legislation meaningful and to ensure that it promotes genuine accountability, the city should make at least five changes to this law. Um, and I'm gonna just briefly describe them here. First, this bill only provides a cause of action when people are detained in violation of the city's laws, of the city's detainer laws. And while this is a good start, we know that there's other types of violations of the city's dis disentanglement laws, including the detainer law, but also the city's um, non using laws prohibiting the use of city resources. These kinds of violations have equally devastating consequences and this legislation should permit suit for violations of those laws as well. Second, this violation should set a statutory damages amount so that when a party proves that one of these laws has been violated, they're automatically entitled to some significant amount of damages at a minimum. This is important because for among other reasons, having to prove damages can create an enormous burden for people whose rights have already been violated as it can expose them to invasive discovery. Third, while this bill provides for prevailing parties to be compensated for the costs expended in litigation, it should explicitly provide for attorney's fees as well so that folks have the genuine opportunity to litigate these cases. Fourth, the bill should impose more transparency inducing measures, including real-time agency reporting of violations and a right to certain documents associated with potential violations so that people don't have to go through the lengthy and frustrating FOIL process. Fifth, and finally, the bill should ensure that damages awards for violations of these laws are paid by the party responsible, whether that be the officer or the agency at fault. Currently, City damages awards are generally paid through a general municipal fund, and it's important that the I'm expired and the officers feel the financial consequences of their actions. So I'll just close by saying this private right of action legislation proposed is a really important step in ensuring municipal compliance with the city's disentanglement laws. And with some of the modifications that I just described, it will be a powerful tool for holding lo local law enforcement accountable. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Luba Cortez to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Luba Cortez. I'm the Immigrant Defense Coordinator at Make the Road New York, the largest participatory and membership led organization in New York that makes that works with Black, Brown, and working class immigrant families. Um, in my role, I have worked with hundreds of families who have had encounters with immigration and customs enforcement, either by witnessing an arrest or being the person detained. Unfortunately, the stories are always deeply traumatizing, involving unnecessary use of force, surveillance, and lack of transparency. And they often end with family and community members confused as to who actually carried out the arrest. ICE agents throughout our city pretend to be police, sowing terror and mistrust. Often family members spend hours calling precincts under the assumption that the police arrested their loved one only to find out later that it was in fact ICE. Conversely, the prevalence of ICE raids by agents masquerading as police officers also causes panic and calls to organizations like Make the Road at the site of operations that turn out to be NYPD. So today I wanna to uplift the story of one of our members who will remain anonymous to protect his identity, um, who was detained in 2020 in the midst and the peak of the COVID pandemic. In the morning of the arrest, ICE agents who did not identify themselves as ICE banged on the door. Scared, he called 911. The police arrived shortly and twice called and urged him to come outside, telling him there was no one there. But that was not true. ICE was there. When he came outside, urged on by two NYPD officers, he was quickly arrested by ICE. Adding insult to injury, the NYPD officers who had lied to him were unmasked in detention, were unmasked. In detention, he quickly caught COVID and ultimately was deported from the country where he had lived since the age of 12. This experience raises several flags and shows that New York City's current laws are inadequate to protect immigrants in the city at all levels. The NYPD should not have rendered assistance to ICE, yet they did. The NYPD also failed to report its contact and assistance to ICE to the city council. In fact, it failed to report it to anyone. This is not a one-off thing. 
It shows this council and the city's continued failure to effectively oversee and prevent NYPD assistance to ICE, a failure that requires new legislation to fix. Situations like the one I shared only incite fear and mistrust between immigrants and local law enforcement. It must be clear whether it is ICE or the NYPD that is conducting an arrest and the NYPD must be prevented from cooperating or encouraging ICE to detain individuals. And there must be accountability and oversight. The same is true for the Department of Corrections, which we know and have heard uh, by all the testimonies today, um, regularly prolongs New Yorkers incarceration as it communicates and considers whether um, to hand them to ICE without oversight or transparency to this council and which tramples on our existing laws by transferring dozens of New Yorkers a year to ICE despite the lack of a judicial warrant. So let's make the road New York Time expired. for a uh, complete and clear prohibition of local law enforcement agencies supporting ICE immigration enforcement actions by A, eliminating the cooperative arrangement um, exception, B, prohibiting any NYPD support for ICE enforcement actions, C, taking action against ICE ruses, impersonating the NYPD, and D, ending all transfers to ICE and all communications between the Department of Corrections and ICE. And in closing, um, immigrants across the country always look to New York City as a sanctuary city, a place where immigrants can feel safe and thrive. But despite the sanctuary moniker, New York City has a long way to go to make immigrants feel safe from ICE and senseless ICE enforcement. The threatens to deprive them of liberty and separates them from their families. Our membership urges you to move away from mechanisms that only serve to terrify our community. Promises will not ameliorate the damage done, and we must see a clear separation between the NYPD and ICE and between the Department of Corrections and ICE. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Zachary Ahmed to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Zach Ahmed. I'm a policy counsel at the New York Civil Liberties Union. Uh, there's a lot to cover here, and we will be submitting fuller written testimony that contains our feedback on these three pieces of legislation and includes other recommendations on how the city can truly disentangle itself from immigration enforcement. In short, we support pre-considered intros 7657 and 7659 to remove some of the harmful carve-outs in the city's detainer laws that currently allow the Department of Correction and the NYPD to work with ICE based on a person's history or a match on a dubious and opaque government watch list. There is no justification for our law enforcement agencies to be transferring people to ICE custody without a judicial warrant, and these misguided loopholes reinforce the harms of a racist criminal legal system. We also support intro 7658 to allow people who have been unlawfully detained for immigration enforcement purposes to bring a claim in court, filling an accountability void and making sure the city's detainer laws have teeth. The city should also extend the opportunity for judicial relief to other situations outside of the detention context in which unlawful cooperation with ICE leads to someone being ensnared by immigration authorities and should consider ways to expand oversight and improve other laws pertaining to an immigration enforcement within the city including local law 228 of 2017. But what I mostly wanna talk about here is resolution 1648 introduced by public advocate Williams and chairman Chaka calling on the state legislature to pass the New York for all act. This is an especially timely resolution coming during the final week of this year's state legislative calendar. The New York for all is a state bill that would prohibit state and local law enforcement and other government agencies from, from cooperating with ICE across New York. It would prohibit the use of public resources for immigration enforcement, prohibit the sharing of sensitive information with ICE, prohibit facilitating transfers of people to ICE custody, and limit access to non-public areas of government property, absent a judicial warrant. This bill would both bolster the local laws we have on the books here in New York City and end the loose patchwork of laws and policies that exist across the state. The City Council is right to take action on its own to improve its own local laws that regulate the NYPD and the DOC's cooperation with ICE, including the bills on today's agenda. But New York for All would go further by circumscribing the powers of law enforcement in New York and making it clear that the duties of police and peace officers who derive their core authority under state law shall not include the authority to enforce immigration law. New York for All does not contain the types of carve-outs that we've discussed today and that have been the source of so much confusion and harmful collusion with ICE and would help fill the gaps in the city's own laws that continue to permit cooperation and transfers to ICE under certain circumstances. 
New York's role would also ensure that law enforcement and local governments across the state are not working hand in hand with ICE, building on the landmark appellate court decision and appellate division decision in 2018 that made clear police in New York cannot detain a person for a civil immigration violation without a judicial warrant. This directly affects the people of New York City. Time expired. A person who lives in outer, if I can just finish, a person who lives in outer Queens would not be, should not be more vulnerable than being targeted for immigration detention and deportation by police if they travel 10 minutes to go grocery shopping in Nassau County. Yet that's exactly what we have now. From county to county, city to city, town to town, police play by different rules when it comes to working from ICE, with ICE and sometimes by no rules at all. New York State needs to follow the lead of other states like California and Washington by removing state and local government from immigration enforcement entirely statewide. The city council having taken progressive steps over the past decade to disentangle law enforcement from ICE, imperfect as those laws are right now, can be a unique and powerful voice on the benefits of doing so. Lawmakers up in Albany are right now deciding on which bills will move before the legislature leaves town and which will wait for another day. So the time to speak up is now. And I thank the council for adding their voice and I urge the committees and the entire council to pass this resolution and the other bills on today's agenda without delay. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to turn it to Chairman Chaka for any questions. Yeah, thank you uh, for this panel. And I think what I, I just wanna lift up are the recommendations from Lindsay and the, uh, the ways to maybe Codify a, a better a better law, especially the private right to action. Uh, and so I, I just say I, I welcome those conversations with you. And and I think most of them are in your testimony. Um, but I'm just alerting the staff right now that I'm going to look at them seriously and let's figure out if we can actually make it even more uh, powerful for New Yorkers to keep. We're trying to keep our city accountable. The city council. We are. Um, we're trying to leap into into where we need to get to, but I think the idea of New Yorkers holding the city accountable as well and giving that power to them is, is, is not only what we need to do, but making it stronger, I hear you. So thank you so much for that. That's wonderful, we're, we're thrilled. And um, I'll be submitting joint testimony with Make the Road New York that outlines some of the suggestions in more detail. So I very much look forward to the work. Beautiful, okay, awesome, thank you. And every single voice that just uh, testified, I wanna say thank you. We hear you. Thank you so much. Um, I'd just like to ask if any other council members have questions at this time. Seeing none, I'm gonna thank this panel for their testimony and we'll be moving on to our next panel. In order, I'll be calling on Yamilka Menya, followed by Meryl Ranzer, followed by Devashish Basnet, followed by Hina Sharma, followed by Alex Zucker, followed by Nathan Yaff, followed by Maureen Silverman. Uh, Yamilka Mena, you may begin when you are ready. Oh, actually, pause really quick. Uh, uh, Harmani, is this the last panel? Yes. OK, so at this point, I just want to just take a, a moment of privilege and let everyone know that I have been contacted by the mayor's office. Um, and the admin says that there is a Department of Corrections and Moya person taking notes uh, during this hearing. So I wanna say thank you to that. Uh, but my request was different. I want them to be on this Zoom call so that we can know, so that people who are testifying know that there's someone on the other end. And I understand that that puts staff, uh, their staff members, and I get that too, that, uh, you know, they're, um, I'm getting new updates. So they are now in Zoom. I think they might be on Zoom. And the whole point that I'm trying to make here is that we are we are dealing with some very serious allegations uh, around accountability for New Yorkers that may be deported. And my preference is to have the commissioners and the chief here directly listening, because that's who we're holding accountable. Staff work on behalf of uh, us at the top. And so that's why I'm making this an extra step along this way. And maybe we're just going to have to build another law that requires the commissioners to stay here and listen to the people um, and not have to send staff uh, to take notes. The commissioners and the people on the top are the ones that we're trying to hold accountable here. 
and that's serious to me uh, and to the committee and the work that we're trying to do. So thank you, and let's continue. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to call on Yamilka Menya for testimony. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Thank you. I think that was a very important thing to say, uh, Councilmember Menchaca. Good afternoon, um, everyone. Uh, my name is Jamal Kamena, and I'm the Director of Immigration Initiatives at the Hispanic Federation. Immigrants are vital to the fabric of America and New York. Um, about 40% of New York City residents are foreign born, and out of that foreign born population, about 6% to 476 are undocumented, the, the vast majority being Latinos. During the height of the pandemic, they became the lifeline of New York City. Um, essential workers, many of them undocumented, supplied and delivered our food, cleaned our hospitals and grocery stores, and were at the forefront of the healthcare industry. And although it was heavily acknowledged that immigrants kept our city running, the undocumented community has continuously best been left out of federal aid. The excluded workers fund passed by the state was a huge win. Um, however, as a sanctuary city, we must ensure that we continue to push for the, the reform that will further mitigate the serious challenges faced by the undocumented community, especially as it pertains to federal immigration enforcement. ICE has had a deep history of cruel and illegal treatment of undocumented immigrants. IDP um, noted that between 2017 and 2018, there was a 1,700% increase in arrest and attempts at arrest by ICE in and around our courthouses. These reports of ICE alone have had a chilling effect on the ways that undocumented immigrants interact in our city. There's a deep embedded fear that is so deeply integrated that many families do not live their full lives. And this anxiety and distress must end. When the Protect Our Courts Act became law in 2020, it was a first step toward protecting the undocumented community from the cruelty of ICE in our court system. Now as these inequities have expanded, um, Hispanic Federation is asking the city council to act more broadly because when immigrants feel safe in their community, they are more likely to participate in our society economically, socially, and civically. Mitigating these fear, the fear of deportation is a responsibility of us all. And the proposed legislation can help us move toward a more just city for everyone. We must reinforce um, the commitment to all New Yorkers despite their immigration status. And we can do that by passing the resolution um, to call on the New York State Legislator to pass and the governor to sign the New York State for All Act. We've all heard a lot about that today. That will further strengthen our New York City retainer laws. Adopting the through resolution to hold these agencies accountable and giving the uh, families and friends um, the ability to sue the city and when those uh, detainer laws are um, violated. And then we also want to um, have city council consider coupling the elimination of ICE from New York City with expanded immigration legal services for the most vulnerable populations in need of representation, along with emphasizing the distribution of um, multilingual community updates pertaining to these ever-changing status of immigration law, detainer policies, and protections from ICE. And lastly, supporting continued expansion of benefits that will support the undocumented community, such as the Excluded Workers Fund. We thank you for your time, and we look forward to working with the City Council um, on the prioritization of policy, policies and programs that will make our undocumented immigrant community feel safe at home in the city they kept moving throughout the gravest of times. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Meryl Ranzer to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Meryl Ranzer, and I work for New Sanctuary Coalition, an immigrants' rights organization here in New York. Um, I'm here today to talk about how both the NYPD and the Department of Corrections failed to comply with New York City's detainer, detainer laws and willingly jeopardize the lives of immigrant New Yorkers. I was at Mamamides Hospital for two days after I received information that ICE had shot Eric Diaz Cruz in the face while attempting to kidnap and detain Gaspar Evandano Hernandez. I witnessed the NYPD working with ICE at Mamamides. And during the summer of 2020, I, uh, during the uprisings after George Floyd was murdered at the hands of police, I witnessed ICE working with NYPD again. I bring this up because it's impossible to believe either, either ICE or the NYPD when they say they do not work together. They lie. How dare we call ourselves a sanctuary and progressive city? At NSC, we've seen years of harm and family separation caused by both, both ICE and the NYPD. Hearing the testimony today of immigrants who've been abused by ICE and the NYPD read by attorneys and advocates is enraging. 
New Yorkers shout at the top of our lungs and protest about injustices at the border and the family separation perpetrated by the Trump administration. Yet, we allow the same level of injustice and cruelty to happen here, driven by the same fear tactics and racism. This whole conversation is dehumanizing to immigrants and is part of our long and in inhumane history of the criminalization of black and brown people. The middle of the road, political niceness, it's unacceptable. Let's choose to be better um, than that here in New York City and stop being complicit in ICE surveillance and enforcement. Abolish ICE, abolish the NYPD. I'm done. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Devashish Bassinet to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Thank you. My name is Devashish Bassanet, and I'm a current student at CUNY Hunter uh, and an immigrant New Yorker. And I'm one of hundreds of thousands of CUNY students that are immigrants or children of immigrants. I'm also here today to talk about how the culture and cooperation between ICE, the NYPD, and Department of Corrections fails to comply with New York City's attainer laws and willingly jeopardizes the lives of immigrant New Yorkers. The emerging nexus between criminalization and immigration status is a horrifying trend emerging in cities across the United States. Trends such as the migration to prison pipeline, programs authorized by 287G, and private detention centers have created a deportation pipeline for immigrants who are often subject to the same predatory criminal legal system that U.S. citizens are. City agencies such as the NYPD and Department of Corrections are complicit in creating this pipeline and are singularly responsible for any immigrant New Yorker falling into the hands of ICE. As the Department of Corrections testified earlier today, one violation is too many. And I agree. The city agencies have demonstrated that they fail to hold the power to exercise discretion, seeing as they have consistently failed immigrant New Yorkers without any oversight. The culture of cooperation is dangerous and antithetical to the scattered testimony of the Department of Corrections today. In fact, as WNYC reports, in the protests and civil unrest of summer 2020, ICE uh, protected precinct houses as police officers were brutalizing New Yorkers uh, in many documented instances of brutality throughout the course of the summer. Furthermore, a detailed Human Rights Watch report cites that a legal observer providing jail support said that ICE agents were spotted at the 40th precinct, raising concerns that uh, they may have been using protest arrests to investigate people's immigration status. Under no circumstances should the NYPD or Department of Corrections be allowed to collaborate with ICE or NYPD. Uh, should they be able to in, uh, share information with ICE, notify ICE of someone's imminent release from NYPD or DOC uh, custody, or transfer people into ICE custody. The detainer laws extend ICE's reach throughout New York neighborhoods, increase our overall jail and prison populations, and exacerbate an existing culture of fear that affects immigrant communities. A sanctuary city protects all immigrant New Yorkers from federal deportation machines, and New York City is failing as, as so long as they uh, allow these loopholes to exist. I urge the council to pass the resolution calling the state legislature uh, to pass New York for all and echo the sentiments of many of the advocates today who have spoken up calling to close all loopholes, allowing communication between ICE and the Department of Corrections and allow for a private cause of action. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Hina Sharma to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Hina Sharma and I am testifying from Staten Island. I'm a youth educator and advocate here in the city and I frequently work with young black and brown immigrants. And I myself immigrated here as a young child from India. The young people I work with are mostly from Queens in neighborhoods that are frequently terrorized by ICE raids, by NYPD targeting them in their high schools and communities with elder family members who often don't speak English, being harassed and living in fear of the police and ICE. How can I tell these young people and their communities that their fear is unfounded and that NYC is actually a sanctuary city when their lived realities say otherwise? Why is it necessary for educators and advocates like myself to teach young people and their families about how ICE will often disguise themselves as NYPD when doing raids and to instead alert them of their rights. But in the end, knowing that ICE will find a way to arrest and detain people regardless. The school to prison to, to deportation pipeline is rampant here in NYC. And it is unconscionable that the city criminalizes, incarcerates and deports young black and brown immigrants who are then trapped in cycles of trauma and lack of resources for most of their lives, if they even live that long. The city council must stop being complicit in ICE surveillance and enforcement and the 177 convictions carve outs. 
give reparations to black and brown immigrants who are survivors of NYPD, DOC and ICE violence. Defund NYPD for regularly flouting NYC law at the expense of the lives of immigrant New Yorkers. Enclose Rikers now without any new jails. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now call on Nathan Yaff to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Nathan and I'm an immigration attorney in the city. I wanna start with an anecdote about a type of DOC abuse that hasn't been discussed enough. I have a friend who wanted me to share his story here. He came to the US as a child in the 1960s and lived in New York for over 50 years. He had an old deportation order, but was basically stateless, so he couldn't be deported. In 2018, he was arrested for something trivial related to his addiction. I raised some money for his bail, but the COs at Rikers told him that he was being held on an ICE detainer. His criminal defense attorney contacted DOC Legal, which said he wasn't in fact being held on an ICE detainer. There was no basis to hold him, so I went to pay his bail. At the bail window, they refused the bail money. They said their record showed an ICE detainer. I left and came back with a printout of New York City Administrative Code 9131 and said, look, you're not allowed to do this. They said, oh, how do we know you didn't alter this document? Is that a valid copy? I said, you've got to be, we'll say, kidding me in this context and eventually left. I couldn't get in touch with his legal aid attorney. And so I had a civil rights attorney I know contact DOC and say, hey, what's going on here? You know, do you want to be sued? They had me come back. I paid the bail and he was eventually released only after another 24 hours had elapsed. Now, I, I want to make four quick points about this story. My, this story that I've shared, my friend's story, is hardly exceptional. In fact, it's extremely routine. Every transfer to ICE is a catastrophic racist failure, and you've talked about investigating seven of them today, but there are stories of harassment and abuse like the one I just shared that are extraordinarily common, also horrific, and get far less attention, but they're symptomatic of the systemic racism and the view of immigrants who have been criminalized as disposable and deportable that's universally held by DOC and NYPD. Due to this abuse that my friend experienced, he lost 72 hours of freedom because of DOC, he was afraid to seek treatment after this because he wasn't sure what city funded programs collaborated with ICE and he lost a job in that 72 hours. And I have personal direct knowledge of at least half a dozen comparable cases that don't ultimately result in arrest or deportation, but reflect the culture of abuse that's endemic at DOC. Second, in later exchanges I had with ICE about this case, they swore up and down that they never in fact issued a detainer because they knew they couldn't deport him. If that's true, DOC was just harassing him because they could. And even if it's not true, it shows DOC undermining the detainer laws by using immigration status to abuse people. This can obviously lead to transfers as we've talked about, but it also leads to informal coordination to pick someone up outside the jail or abuses like my friend experiences, experience. I'm confident that but for the fact that he could not be deported, he would have been arrested by ICE on his release, despite not falling into the conviction card. I'm inspired. I implore the council to be realistic about what power in DOC and NYPD's hands means in this context. They will find any way they can to use immigration status against people, even when it's just quote unquote lower level abuses like the one I just shared. That's why there should not be any wiggle room in terms of carve outs. There should be a blanket ban on honoring detainers because if you open the door a crack, they will push through as much as they can. And this is why to really protect immigrant New Yorkers, you need to defund the NYPD and close Rikers with no new jails because whenever they have that power over people, they will use it in this way. And shrinking their power is the only way to shrink the abuses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Maureen Silverman to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Maureen Silverman. I'm testifying from Manhattan as a member of Survived and Punished New York. My focus today is, is on, on the human tragedy caused by failing to protect immigrant New Yorkers through laws such as the detainer laws and the state level New York for all bill. Asia Serrano is a survived and punished um, New York member. She's a friend to many of us who visit her and correspond with, uh, with her. 
She is a beautiful poet. She is a mother. She is someone who's, who's cared for other children within Bedford. She was incarcerated in New York over 15 years for actions taken under the immense psychological duress of her abusive partner. This year, she was released early under a law called the Domestic Violence Survivors Justice, Justice Act in recognition of the fact that her abuser's coercive control and psychological manipulation contributed, contributed significantly to the commission of the crime. Instead of releasing her to freedom, however, New York transferred her directly to ICE, which is currently incarcerating her and imminently trying to deport her. She now faces being permanently separated from her family and her entire life in the United States, including her children. First, and obviously, I acknowledge Asia's, Asia's transfer is a state level issue, and I urge this council to pass its resolution calling on the state to enact the New York for All Act, which would have prevented um, Asia's transfer to ICE if it had been law today. But second, I feel compelled to mention that New York City also bears responsibility for tragedies like the one playing out in Asia's case. The Tatana laws are inherently flawed because they allow for immigrant New Yorkers to be turned over to ICE based on their criminal convictions. Not only are there instances when NYPD and DOC actively, actively collaborate with ICE as is well documented and discussed by prior testimony, but also the mere arrest and fingerprinting of people by NYPD triggers automatic notification for ICE. There should be no exemptions in the detainer laws, no data sharing and no collaboration. Enacting legislation to prevent NYPD and DOC from, from, an acting, from, act, from acting as ISIS foot soldiers is an essential first step towards NYC living up to the idea that it is a sanctuary city, which at present is Time a misstatement fine. as best and a cruel joke at worst. And the detainer laws and the detainer law carve outs defund NYPD, close Rikers now with no new jails, free them all. I call on New York City Council to end the cruel, inhumane, hypocritical practices in New York City and New York State by enacting the recommendations of Survived and Punished New York. It is time for New York City to truly protect and treat immigrants and other vulnerable communities with the dignity they deserve. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I'd like to turn it to Councilmember, uh, excuse me, Chairman Taka for any questions. Uh, I do not have uh, questions. Uh, I, have, I have a final statement, oh. but I just wanna say that this, this last panel really, I think highlighted the, the importance of the connections that we have to make across all of the systems of justice. And I want to say thank you for that, including Merrill, who reminded us of the incident in my district. Well, actually, it didn't happen in my district, but it was at Maimonides in South Brooklyn, where we were uh, hours after the incident with the family for 48 hours, really just confused by the cooperation that was happening between the NYPD and and ICE. And I will never forget that. That is something that continues to drive me in terms of how we solve the issues. Um, but I just want to say thank you to the panel for, for really speaking that truth to power. And, and abolishing ICE is something that I believe in and I want to keep paying. I don't know if you have any questions. Oh, was that, no, um, no, I just want to say uh, thank, thank you to everyone for uh, your testimony here today and, and Chairman Chaka for his work and partnership here in terms of pursuing ways to both fix existing gaps, but also make our city a much better place when it comes to how we treat our fellow New Yorkers. So no, no questions, but I want to say a big thank you to staff and my chair here, fellow chair here for the work here today. 
Thank you, chairs. I'm just going to quickly ask if we have inadvertently missed anyone that is registered to testify today and is yet to be called. Please use the Zoom raise hand function now, and you will be called on in the order that your hand has been raised. Okay, I'm not seeing any hands, um, so I'm going to turn it back to the chairs for closing remarks. Chairman Taka. Yeah, thank you. Um, I also want to thank staff for being here today for organizing this on the on the committees that, that have been working together now for several weeks to ensure that we had a very positive, productive hearing. Um, especially Councilmember Holden, who's actually here here as well in person uh, for this for this conversation. Thank you. Um, and then I also want to say thank you to Chelsea, who was on here from the Department of Corrections. Thank you so much uh, for for being present. And uh, I believe there was a Moya representative here as well. Uh, we will be following up with you. There are many things that we're going to follow up on. And I just uh, also want to say thank you to Chair Powers for uh, our, our work together. Our work together isn't just to these committees. They're at the Progressive Caucus. We are both on the budget negotiation team. We're, and we are deep in that discussion right now. And so we hear you when we think about what we need to do to solve that gap for justice for our immigrant neighbors, many of them essential workers that have kept the city alive and thriving uh, in the midst of, of a pandemic. Um, but I also wanna say that so much has happened in this hearing that has allowed for us to understand that the, that the Department of Corrections and the NYPD and the defenders all of this system that we've been trying to get moving in a in a good way have holes loopholes there are loopholes and we have solutions and that's where the laws that we are proposing today the pre-considered laws especially are going to help fix that uh, we heard some really great ideas on how to make them better and so i'm really excited to work with our committee staff to figure out we can do that uh, but we are living in a world right now where not one federal judicial warrant has been issued here in the city of New York, yet 90 people have been effectively transferred to ICE. That is a problem that we can fix. We have city workers who are taking it upon themselves to pledge allegiance to whatever they're trying, and I'm going to be calling it white supremacy or racism or xenophobia or something else that is contrary to the spirit of the law, and that is a major flag, and we have ways to fix that. We must hold NYPD and the Department of Corrections accountable to ensure that none of them get away with it and that none of them continue to serve with the power that they have in holding a gun or keys to a jail cell. That is my, that, that is my belief that no one that, that exhibits this kind of uh, anti-New Yorker sentiment is allowed to continue in this work, uh, in this justice work. Uh, and then finally, I want to say something about sanctuary, because we we talk a lot about sanctuary and and I'm just realizing that my sense of sanctuary is connected to not a, a destination. It's not a place that we can be at at any one moment on a map, say, like New York City even, but that sanctuary is more like a compass. It is a direction that is all, all the time pointing us in a way that we need to continue to move. We are going to be in constant struggle for sanctuary. Things are going to continue to change. Presidents are going to change. The mayor is going to change. All these people are going to change. And we need to keep walking in, in formation towards that sanctuary. So it is a movement. It is moving. And these laws that we're proposing and the conversations and the follow-up that are going to happen are in that spirit. Uh, and so with that, uh, I'm, I'm done. I can't remember or chair powers. Do you have any final words? I hear you loud and clear, and I appreciate everyone's work here today and your testimony and all the advocates who have been bringing this, uh, these issues forward to us. And so uh, I hope we will be able to pass these bills quickly. And I want to say thank you to everyone for being here today. Wonderful. And with that, uh, we call this hearing to close. Thank you all.